Arenas and her family uh, are feeling better. We know, uh, you know, I haven't had a chance to speak with Councilmember Arenas. I did see her post and uh, she's one of our, now she's gonna be one of our statistics that the county's gonna be reporting on. Uh, she came down with COVID and she's, let me just tell you, she's been very careful. I've been keeping track and we've been talking quite a bit since, since March and since all of this started because she has also her mother-in-law who's uh, elderly and so she was especially careful and so there you go we don't know where we get it from and um and so i hope that she uh if she's listening and i hope she's not listening actually i hope she's sleeping and and taking care of herself uh but so you all are going to have to help me out here a little bit because mm -hmm. i don't have the i don't have the uh the guide that she usually uh has but but yeah. we'll carry on, team. We will definitely help you out. And yeah, we definitely wish Councilmember in as well. And so kind of the first uh, item would be calling uh, the meeting to order. And uh, we could have uh, somebody from the city clerk's office do roll call. Jimenez? Jimenez? Foley? Here. Esparza? Here. Crosco? Present. Sorry, the garbage truck just was right in front of my house. As I called roll, it made me laugh. I apologize. Yeah. So I think we have, have a quorum, quorum, correct? Yes, you have a quorum, sorry. Yeah. Okay, great. And, yeah, and the first action, uh, Vice Chair, is uh, we, we have three items um, uh, that are, are being dropped. Uh, one was dropped. The first one is the anti graffiti anti litter beautify SJ report. And as you know, there was a study session, a very comprehensive study session last Friday uh, that took the place of this. And then the, the other two items are being deferred, dropped out of off this agenda, but uh, being placed on uh, the next work plan. Uh, so that's the action item there that would need a vote. And, and uh, is that the homeless annual report? Um, the uh, yeah the uh, home annual report and then the blighted properties and responsible landlord engagement initiative report both of those will be placed on the next uh, NSC work plan. Okay, well, uh, can we take uh, can we take? I have, I have a question. question. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, of course, Councilmember Sparza. Sorry, I know there's a lot going on um, and we're all shifting gears. Um, I uh, had a question. So those two items, the homeless annual report and the blighted properties and responsible landlord engagement initiative report, those are being placed on next year's work plan. But when will that come back to NSE? Yeah, um, so that's coming back. I believe the blighted report and responsible landlord is coming back uh, in June. And then the homeless annual report, uh, Reagan, I think you're, I think Reagan is on the line here. Um, in fact, I have my agenda. I just would Hi. have to pull it up. Hi, council member. This is Reagan Henninger with the housing department. We moved that homeless annual report to February, I believe, just due to some staff bandwidth issues in our COVID response. Sure. And um, so, and, and that that's kind of my question. I, I get that, uh, the, you know, COVID is all consuming, <laughs> um, but on the, I just wanted to ask a clarification on the blighted properties and RLEI issue. Um, so that coming back in June, that is typically, you know, like code violations and people living in, in my opinion, substandard living conditions. Mm -hmm. Um, feeling like they have to do that because they can't afford something else. They can't afford to leave. Um, can we, so that's coming back to NSE in June. Can we get an info memo before that or just some update? Because I, I'm not trying to add to the mm -hmm. workload because we're dealing with an eviction cliff and a whole bunch of other things that are coming up. But this does, there is a correlation between this yeah. work and the, um, and, and the same group of people that are under so much pressure. So um, I'm comfortable with moving this to June, 2021, as long as we get an update, um, you know, February, March. I, I, if, and even if it's in an existing report that has a section in it, sure. I'm okay with that. Again, because they are correlated, that's, um, th that would be fine with me. And, and, and I, uh, I just think it's important information. Thank you. 
Okay, that, that's a very good point. I do see Reagan nodding her head, so we could definitely do that. Uh, uh, we'll, what we'll do is we'll, you know, if, if you approve this, we'll move this, that specific item to June, but then issue a, a info report in the January, February timeframe. And uh, as per the, uh, the motion there, the recommendation. Yep. Okay, and I'll move, I'll move, uh, I'll move that. I'll move moving the work plan and with that adoption with a, a report info memo in January, February. Okay. Second. Second. And you're moving, uh, Council Member Sparza, you're moving both items? Correct. Okay. Okay. Good teamwork. So we have a motion on the floor. We have a second. And uh, do we need to take roll yes. on this? Fully? Fully? Aye. Sparza? Yes. Costco? Aye. Thank you. Yay. On to consent calendar, there's nothing there. We're on to our reports. And uh, do we have a uh, presentation for our uh, annual performance evaluation report, otherwise known as CAPER? Yes, Council Member, oh. we do have a presentation. This is Reagan Henniger with the Housing Department. Let me share my screen. I'm sorry, before you before you continue, uh, uh, this is where I'm gonna need Tony's assistance. Uh, Tony, you know, this is the first time I'm really chairing a committee. So you're going to have to help me with the protocol regarding anybody that might be on the phone. I don't wanna skip anyone. And I see Mr. Beekman. Uh, can you help me out with the protocol? Because I don't know if Mr. Beekman wanted to speak or, or if he was uh, speaking on anything that we may have just gone over right now? Um, I wasn't looking to see if he had his hand up for- His hand is up. I know it's up now. I was, I'm not sure if it was up for work plan, but if you wanna take his comment on the work plan now. Yeah, how do I, how do I get him, get him I, on the microphone? Um, let's, let's do this first. I'm gonna stop the pr presentation and then I'm gonna allow Mr. Beekman to speak. Mr. Beekman, you have two minutes. Hi. And this is the work plan. Yes, correct. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak at the work plan. Uh, Councilperson Perales allowed myself to speak on the changes to the work plan for the PISFIS meeting earlier this morning. I think it's a better way to work. And when you, when you have to change items or when items are dropped, to, uh, to allow the public comment, uh, you know, there is certain Brown Act protocols that, that you know, it, it does ask and state that, you know, the public has a right to speak uh, on those dropped items. Not all the time, but uh, a majority of the time. If an item hasn't been before a council before uh, or a committee process before, the, the public has a definite right to speak on that item. So uh, look up the Brown Act. This is stuff we were talking about in the fall. I hope we can work on this issue and, and be very clear into next year about uh, what we can do about this issue. Because I... Man, I just love the chance to talk about, you know, items that are of public interest. And uh, so the, these have, uh, you know, these are housing ideas. And you had a good week this past week uh, on council agenda items and, and yesterday in, in rules and open government. You know, uh, you're developing really good housing ideas and funding ideas for people of low income and with uh, forgiveness uh, issues. Uh, you know, with rental forgiveness needs basically at this time. And thank you as a city, you know, you want to work on, on that and facilitate that. That's a lot for a city to work towards and, and to be able to offer its community. And it seems more than just state funding ideas. So thank you that, that you can make those efforts. Um, I'm worried about the fireworks uh, ordinance. You're going to be practicing some surveillance technology and ticketing on that possibly. I hope it doesn't spill over into, you know, you know, uh, wanting to ticket homeless people with trash issues. I hope we're dealing on a completely different level of good communication with trash, with trash and homeless issues. So much so, I mentioned, you know, the idea, can you play, maybe create an app where both people of neighborhoods and everyday uh, and, and the homeless people can have a way to communicate on the app. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Beekman. Uh, Tony, um, 
Is it you or is it I that can that announces the way for our public to get online or on on the mic? Um, it's you. I'm actually looking for my script. I can do that for you. Um, I'll, I'll I'll find my script while Reagan's doing her presentation, okay. and I can read that um, for you. Okay. Thank you. Like me too. Thank you. Reagan, take it away. Here we go. Thank you, Reagan. All right, good afternoon, uh, vice chair and committee members. I'm Reagan Henniger, the deputy director of the city of San Jose's housing department. And we're here to review the consolidated annual performance and evaluation report known as the CAPER, which is an annual requirement by the uh, US Department of Housing and Urban Development or HUD. And uh, as I just said, this is a year end report and it's uh, backward looking that reports out on how the city spent all of its federal funds, which include CDBG, HOME, COPWA and ESG funding. And last year we had four priorities that you can see here on the screen. And then along came global pandemic. And we have a uh, fifth priority, which was the COVID-19 response. So I'm gonna briefly go over some of the highlights in each of these priority performance areas. So I'll start with our COVID response because that has been so um, urgent and required such a massive response. And we have seen a tremendous influx of one-time funding from the Federal CARES Act. And as you can see here, our normal annual uh, funds from HUD is about $14 million. Well, with HUD, you can see that has increased substantially. And it's important to note that this does not include uh, additional state grants that we received due in response to the coronavirus, and it does not include the general coronavirus relief funds that the city received. So all told, the department received about 100 million in new funds in fiscal year 1920, which was desperately needed to respond to COVID-19 but it did create a tremendous amount of work for our small team of eight uh, grant analysts who develop and monitor our grants contracts. And since March, this tiny but mighty team has been working 80 plus hours a week. And I'm so grateful for their dedication to quickly move out these funds to our community serving organization um, into the hands of people who so desperately need our assistance. So our COVID-19 response has funded a variety of things uh, that you can see here on the slide. But some additional programs that we funded included the temporary shelters at South Hall, Parkside, Camden Community Center, and the Bascom Community Center. We've also funded an isolation and quarantine program in partnership with the county we funded the food delivery programs that so quickly ramped up by our city's emergency operations center. And we funded grants to small businesses. And uh, it's important to note in what you'll see in, in this presentation, there's a lot of data about um, numbers served, but it does not include a lot of our COVID response data Many of these uh, programs went into contract uh, later in the fiscal year, end of quarter three or in quarter four. And so we're not seeing a lot of the data back yet from some of these programs. So we will have more comprehensive data in next year's report. So this brings us to our four original priorities. And the first is increasing and preserving affordable housing opportunities. Our home funded rental assistance program assisted 337 households 
And we also finished two affordable housing developments also funded with home funds. And those were Second Street Studios and Villas on the Park. Responding to homelessness is our second priority area. And in last fiscal year, we funded homeless street outreach teams with PATH and Home First, and also our overnight warming locations at city facilities. We also funded what's called the Coordinated Care Program, which is a housing and case management program for chronically homeless individuals. And last year, that program permanently housed 166 individuals. And we also funded a homeless prevention program with Bill Wilson Center, which is the 40 fam 47 families you see here on the presentation. But I do want to note that this does not, because this paper is focused on our federal funding, it does not include funding that we um, use for our larger homeless prevention system with Destination Home that we funded with state keep and HAP funds. Our uh, third priority area is strengthening neighborhoods. And in this category, we funded uh, two organizations, Somos Mayfair and Calm University for leadership development and some safety net services. We also, uh, on this slide, you'll see two COVID related responses. The first was a contract with Lowe's and Fishes uh, through our emergency operations center to provide meals. And the second was a partnership with Opportunity Fund where we funded, uh, we did micro enterprise loans to um, small business owners. Also in this category, we fund uh, investments in the city's capital projects and improvements. We funded uh, pedestrian improvements in primarily in District 7, 3, and 5. Um, because of this federal funding, we are required to do these capital improvements in areas that are uh, low income census tracts. And so that work was concentrated, as I said, primarily in districts three, five, and seven. And then we had one COVID related uh, um, project in this area and that was funding our community wireless network. During COVID, as you all know, we saw a, uh, an increased need for access to um, wireless. And then also in this strengthening neighbor neighborhoods category, we have two contracts, one with Habitat for Humanity and the other with Rebuilding Together for home repairs. And combined these two programs assisted 217 low-income San Jose residents with urgent safety and accessibility repairs to their home. And we also funded targeted code enforcement in the neighborhoods of Santee, Five Wounds, Brookwood Terrace, Round Table, Hoffman Via Monte, Foxdale, and the Cadillac neighborhoods. And then the final priority is promoting fair housing. And the city funded two programs in this category. First, we funded a nonprofit consortium comprised of four organizations, which include the Law Foundation, Project Sentinel, Senior Adult Legal Assistance, and Asian Law Alliance. And this consortium offered comprehensive fair housing program that included things like uh, discrimination complaint investigations, uh, enforcement and litigation services, and general kind of fair housing workshops and education. And then the second contract was with also with a legal consortium specifically for legal services for low income tenants and landlords to assist in enforcing the city's apartment rent ordinance and our tenant protection ordinance. And this legal consortium was comprised of five different nonprofit agencies, 
including Law Foundation, Bay Area Legal Aid, Project Sentinel, Senior Adult Legal Assistance, and Asian Law Alliance. And you can see here the results of both of those grants. The guy that called the lead. Councilmember Carrasco, I think you're not muted. Councilmember Carrasco. Uh, lastly, as I mentioned in the in an earlier slide, the city's COVID response has uh, been quite massive and um, required really some extraordinary uh, efforts by our city staff, and we are still very much in an active response mode. And for that reason, we're recommending that we continue with our current um, contracted grantees in the next fiscal year, fiscal year 21-22, because we are lacking the staff capacity to do uh, new RFPs. And so those contracts that we um, are specifically recommending are on page 19 of the staff report. And then finally, the next steps for this CAPER report will be at our housing commission this evening. And we are uh, recommending this report get referred to the full council for next Tuesday, December 15th. And our deadline to submit to HUD is on December 27th. I'm happy to take any questions. I have a question. I don't know if anyone else has raised their hand. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Now we're all working. Uh, council member, uh, as far as uh, let me, can I, do you mind go if ahead. I can see the No, go ahead. I just, the, type, the screen was looking weird. That's why I spoke up. I'm fine. Yeah. And I, I, uh, doc, uh, doctor, uh, Mr. Beekman. Hello, it is Beekman here. Hi. Um, for this uh, item, uh, you know, kind of a continuation of, of, uh, of homeless uh, issues and ideas. Um, thank you. Uh, I guess to make clear, you know, thank you that you're working on on rent forgiveness ideas uh, for for people. And hopefully, I can make that clear that as a city, uh, what your city council and and uh, and rules and open government yesterday were talking about were these sorts of issues. Uh, so thank you. Rent forgiveness is is important at this time. Um, I know Robert Aguirre, in terms of homeless issues, he's been around city council lately to talk about how, uh, you know, there needs to be a bit more representation uh, from the homeless community on committees and commissions. And uh, I, I, we've been talking about that for years. I hope it, it'll be coming through soon and, and that, that can be happening. I think it would be a really good voice to have on on government uh, committees, city government committees. To conclude, um, to, to return to uh, the funding ideas, you know, we're at a time that, um, you know, it's gonna be a really difficult winter, it sounds like, for small businesses um, in San Jose, if not, you know, the area in the country. And I, I, I just, I've been trying to learn, you know, I've spoken a few times at council this week, I'm trying to learn, I have to try to learn to say it again. What I've been trying to say all fall is the ideas of, we have to be open to the ideas of funding and that there's state mechanisms that are working really well to develop funding for local cities. And they're getting you know some money from federal agencies and then learning how to really develop those. We have to be open to that at the local level. And we have to consider that we're at a time of not just, you know, we have to be for, forgiving of ourselves and not be stuck with the debt burden ideas. We have to learn to be open to funding, you know, and not accept debt burden. It is not our fault what is going on. And, and that takes effort and work. And I hope we can do that. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Beekman. And I'll return to my council colleagues, council member Esparza. Thank you. Sorry about jumping the gun before. I, um, I just, you know, we're going to talk about this shortly. Um, so I'll keep my comments and questions brief. Um, I, uh, I, I'll focus on um, really a couple. Um, one is um, with our work with nonprofit partners, I think we've, uh, because we had to ramp up so quickly, we had no time and, and the situation was rapidly changing and continues to uh, change pretty rapidly. Um, but 
now we're nine months into it. We have, you know, probably next year um, that we will have uh, lots of things to deal with. Um, we have leaned a lot on um, some nonprofits in our community, both large and very small. Um, you mentioned Somos Mayfair earlier. Um, they're a pretty, you know, they're small but mighty, and um, and they're also geographically based. And and we keep going. And I'm just using them as an example. I'm not picking on them, but we keep going to them over and over again to represent really issues that are all over the city, um, and the. Um, and and the, we would normally, under under different circumstances, expect a larger organization to address. Do we have plans to invest in um, other nonprofits? In, and do we also have plans to do capacity building so that these nonprofits that we're asking of all sizes that we're asking to ramp up, um, are we looking at that now that we have had a small chance to take a breath. So, um, you know, with our federal funding, because we are, we are required to spend it in certain census tracts that are um, low income, the, that's the advantage of contracting with the Somos Mayfair or Com University is because they are so dialed into um, those neighborhoods that we need to, to uh, be working in with these federal funds. Um, you know, I, I, I mentioned at the very end of the presentation about just our uh, staff capacity right now is really lacking in terms of being able to do any new RFPs for um, services or capacity building for nonprofits. But I think um, we're super open to thinking about how we can help the organizations that we are currently working with on their um, capacity issues, because honestly, we we do lean on them a lot. Um, and they have risen to the challenge during COVID. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it's a, it's a completely important um, point that you raise council member about wanting to make sure those partners um, are able to continue partnering with us um, through this pandemic and beyond. Yeah, thank you. And I, and I know that there isn't like a, you know, we have our own capacity issues, but, but also there isn't sort of like, I always, I tell people in the community, there isn't a magic wand that we can just wave and fix it all. Um, typically, it's going to be a menu of lots of different things that we do, whether it's COVID, whether it's homelessness, whether it's some of the big issues that we tackle as a community, it isn't there isn't going to be a one and done. Um, it's which I know a lot of people do want, but um, but I do think that it it behooves us to try and figure out how to how to provide more capacity. As stretched as we are, they are just on a next level, and um, uh, and and a lot of small but mighty nonprofits are really just operating from the heart, but they're literally like. Um, killing themselves, you know, out there. And so anyway, that's, I just, I think that's an important issue that as we go into this next phase, we have um, the luxury that we did not have in uh, March and April and May of kind of knowing a little bit more about what's ahead of us. So, um, so that's one issue. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, the city, our, our own city folks, <clears throat> excuse me, and our nonprofit partners for literally saving lives um, between, and I represent District 7, I think between myself and Councilmember Carrasco, we represent um, really the city's hardest, the county's hardest hit areas. Um, and then we have our neighbor to the South Gilroy, but 95122 has more COVID cases than the entire city of Gilroy. And the food distributions, the motelling, the sheltering have literally saved lives. Um, they just, they have. And um, it's, it's 
critical, critical work. And um, the county had a referral that came up before them on Tuesday um, about uh, uh, their isolation and relief programs and offering some streamlining, some standardization and some reporting um, changes to that. Um, there seemed to, after that meeting, there seemed to be some confusion um, about isolation. And so I wanted to ask today, and I'll ask again on Tuesday because more people listen into the city council meeting than they do here, but um, I just wanted to say it out loud um, we are not cutting back our support for isolation. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. And um, so with that, I'll just add, um, I'm sure there'll be more discussed on Tuesday, but um, I wanted to just add my support for supervisors Ellenberg and Chavez for their leadership on that um, streamlining standardization and uh, reporting. It, it is super critical. I have seen more and more in my district that, um, which is very hard hit um, in COVID, that people are afraid to get tested because they're dealing with all these financial issues. They're either unemployed or underemployed. And, um, and the isolation, again, is saving not just their lives or their families' lives, but all of our lives, right? If they work in in Santana Row, or if they work in some other part of the city, it's saving all the people that they could possibly interact with as well. And so I just wanted to, um, to, to offer my support for the county's streamlining work. Um, and we'll, because we share the pots of money, then does our money also get streamlined and along with what the county's doing? Is that correct? Yeah. So we're funding that county program, which, as you said, they have really um, been working hard to improve it, to streamline it, to make modifications um, to better serve our community. And, and we're directly funding that program where, and the city is not um, leaning back. If anything, we're leaning in and continue to support uh, and fund that program. Good, thank you. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Cody has talked about the deaths that we can expect in a few weeks as things get worse before they get better. And so this is a critically important program. Um, and I'm sure there'll be more uh, questions next week. But I think that I, that's the message I wanna get out to our partners, to the public, is that this, this program is not going away. This, this assistance will still be there. Please get tested, please don't gather and don't go to work if you're sick. So that's it for me, thank you. Thank you, council member Sparza. Council member Foley. Thank you, uh, council member Sparza, always on point with your questioning, particularly your capacity building questions. I really appreciate your, your line of uh, thinking in that regard and uh, truly your city, your zip codes and council member Carrasco's are heaviest hit within the city of San Jose, no question about that, indisputable. So our resource sources should be allocated there to the greatest extent possible. Doesn't mean that our other districts aren't affected, every district is, but just not to the same level. And we all recognize that and know that you are hardest hit and, um, wish it wasn't so, but it is, and we need to make sure that we take care of those re your residents as much as possible. Um, Reagan, uh, I wanna thank you for the report and it's incredible the amount of money that you have been handed this year to deal with this huge crisis and how well your department has really pivoted to dealing with it. Uh, I know there's been a learning curve over the la over the months, but I am really impressed with how you've been able to manage it. And we have the, the auditor's report taking a look at how the funds were allocated. And that was pretty impressive actually, considering how much money you received and then passed on to other non to nonprofits, how many of them were fulfilling the obligations that they needed to as outlined in the in the requirements of the MOU and the, the funding cycle. So I'm, I'm really, really impressed by that. But I wonder, um, is the, and I understand it's a capacity on the side of 
your staff not being able to send out any more requests for proposals and looking for any other nonprofits or expanding uses at current nonprofits, but are there any red flags or do you have any concerns in the list or that are there groups that we're missing in that list that should that are obvious nonprofits that we should be reaching out to that we just haven't had the capacity to yet, but who could really be a big help in this regard? Thank you for the question, council member. Um, you know, I, I should say we did um, release an RFP for our rapid rehousing program and for a new uh, employment program. And those uh, will be coming to council on Tuesday. And we also released an RFP to um, find an operator for the hotel that we purchased under Project Home Key, that uh, state grant opportunity. Uh, so RFPs, uh, some are being done, but you know that those RFPs are on top of all of the COVID response. Um, I will say we have um, been able to um, enter into contracts with some new service providers without doing an RFP um, based on some flexibility with the COVID emergency that does allow us to kind of um, not, not go through as many steps. So we've been able to, for example, contract with Nextdoor Solutions to Domestic Violence for some rental assistance. We're talking to them as well about some uh, emergency motel programs. So um, it's really been an, an effort <clears throat> to find uh, organizations that have the expertise and the capacity to respond. Um, so I will say if it's a COVID related program, we do have some flexibility to work with um, partners without doing an RFP. Okay, I appreciate that. And of course the concern is they, they ramp up their programs and we get through COVID, which we will, but then we have to reduce the expenditures to them resulting in a reduction of an expenditure to the nonprofit. So I hope they're all paying attention to that component of their budget as we are, because these are not funds that yeah. we're gonna be able to rely on next year. And we don't even know what we're gonna get next year from the federal government in, in the next bailout. But I really appreciate that. I know there'll be a lot more discussion and conversation next week at the council meeting, but I wanted to thank you uh, here after your presentation and applaud you for the work you're doing and how how well uh, you are really handling the fiduciary responsibility of the funds that are coming in. So thank you very much. That's it for me, Chair. Thank you. Um, and I'm looking to see if anybody else ha uh, had any, any feedback. I see that Council Member Jimenez has joined us. Uh, Council Member Jimenez, would you like to make a comment? I don't have a comment. Uh, I think everything's been stated. I, I did appreciate the comments around um, <clears throat> the council member Esparza made around uh, the the uh, going to the same organizations uh, time and again and, and that wearing them down. Um, I also, uh, you know, outside of COVID and such, we also know that there's many of these organizations I think would love the opportunity to expand in other parts of the city that I think are very much needed. So you round table in district two uh, and Cadillac and on and on, right? There's other places and so, I think it's just important not to forget that uh, there's a lot of areas of need and some of these organizations are stretched thin and having been a past board member of Somos Mayfair, I certainly know firsthand some of the challenges they have trying to do everything that we ask them to do. So I, I appreciated uh, council member Sparza elevating that because I think it's important. But other than that, thank you so much for the report. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you, council member Jimenez. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna have to, I have to echo the, the same sentiment um, uh, I love uh, the work that Somos does, and of course, of course, it sits squarely in the middle of my district, and it does fantastic work. It works with our youth, it works with our seniors, it works in the area of art, it works in the area of organizing with promotoras. Uh, it, I mean, I can go on and on. It, they're the staunch supporters of affordable housing, and 
Uh, they're at every round table. They start every task force that we, we, we need. And uh, I can't imagine a day when their voices uh, are not at uh, a round table advocating for the needs of our residents. Uh, of course, they were part of, of the census as well. And <clears throat> I mean, I can go on and on and on and on. And, uh, and so they've grown from a, a very tiny little uh, organization to what we now know is uh, part of, a, of an ongoing conversation, just about any sort of social justice or inequity conversation, Somos is front and center. Uh, but, I, but I do think that uh, in an effort to keep, um, keep them uh, it, at a place where they can continue to do the good work that they do, um, maybe it's a conversation we need to have with them and, and be able to gauge truly what their capacity is or how we support a capacity building. How do we um, not tax them and, uh, and compromise the quality of their work? And also, how do we bring in other nonprofit organizations so that they can either replicate or um, do other kinds of work that we really truly need from other nonprofits so that we can continue serving our residents because we can't do it alone, surely. And the county can't do it alone. And that's why we depend on our, our nonprofit partners to be able to assist us. And that's the magic of, of all of this. And so we know that in, in post COVID, in recovery from COVID, we're going to need all hands on deck to really help us uh, come out of this um, as best as possible. And, and I think that there's going to be just a lot of work to go around. And so who do we support so that they can do this kind of work in assisting our, our community? So I think that's a, a worthwhile conversation to be had. Um, Reagan, thank you so much for, for the report. Uh, I know it's going to be, this will be cross-referenced for this coming Tuesday, did you say? Yes, I think that's part of the uh, recommendation in the staff report is to refer it to council for this Tuesday, the 15th. And um, with the cross reference to the full council. Second. Thank you so much for that, Council Member Jimenez. Uh, I, I will say, you know, um, in, in this time of, of great need uh, to be able to use the funds wisely and to be able to leverage every little bit that we have is um, it, it's no small feat. And so I appreciate what the entire housing department has been able to do and, um, and the creativity and the partnerships that we have. There, you know, my, my, my concern is what's about to happen after December, um, because just as we had been kind of coming out of the darkness uh, that was the first SIP order, uh, we get hit again with, uh, with this new uh, stay at home order. And then we see our numbers go up dramatically. And, you know, I, a lot of the chatter that I'm hearing on social media and different circles is, well, you know, but the deaths are not, uh, the loss of life is not as high. Uh, you know, you hear a lot of this kind of thing. And, and I, I hope it's not, I, I truly do. But as the numbers keep rising, it's inevitable that you're going to start to see a rise in, in the toll of, uh, of life in the loss of life. But, but in addition to that, we don't know what the long-term impacts are going to be on our community, even for those that do survive it. And, and that's the, the mystery of this virus is the, the long-term health impacts on people who still come out of this. And, um, and, and it's on young people as well. We're seeing you know, nine months later, young people who came out of it very healthy are starting to have uh, health implications. And that's, the, that's the, a very scary lifelong impact on, on, our, on our communities. And so, um, uh, we'll see what the next uh, kind of coronavirus relief packages we we um, we get from the new uh, administration. But thank you so much, and we have a motion. And with that, roll call, please, Miss Madam Clerk. Yes. 
Yes. Foley? Aye. Ms. Barza? Yes. Carrasco? Aye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, lady. And with that, we will move on to uh, our next uh, item, which is the scholarships and fee activity report. And who do, who will be presenting on that, Angel? That's going to be PRNS, John and his team. Great. Hi, John. Welcome. Hi. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Council members. So um, some of this will be a little bit of a repeat for you. You know, we've had this conversation with you all before in this committee. Um, you know, not unlike the item before, uh, this one got off track because of the virus showed up. We actually had um, some ideas going into the budget process for 2021, and all of that had to, along with many, many other things, had to be left aside. Um, but we've also got some lessons we've learned through COVID, so more lessons and things that we're seeing. And um, we've done some additional thinking about how we think we should organize this. And ultimately we're just, we're interested in your feedback. Um, and if it's, if it's lining up with your thinking as well. So I'm gonna hand this over to Andrea Flores Shelton. She's our interim deputy director over recreation neighborhood services. Dave DeLong is our interim division manager over um, our administrative uh, uh, processes. And Hal Spangenberg is our interim division manager in uh, RNS. So uh, the interim team will take it away. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Um, and good afternoon, um, honorable council members. Um, today, uh, we do have a presentation before you, but we have um, a, a few recommendations. Uh, we'd like you to accept the report on scholarship and fee activity, as well as provide feedback and direction to us regarding equitable access to community center programs aligned with the education policy 0-30 that you all approved earlier this year, um, as well as the pricing and revenue policy 1-21 that we will be speaking about. Um, and before we go into to that, I do wanna kind of go backwards a little bit um, and, and dive into just a little bit about what PRNS, uh, John Cicerelli and Neil Rufino uh, reported last year, just to, to remind you where we've been. Um, we did come to you before and discuss how the recession of 10 to 12 years ago um, and how that deeply um, made significant cuts to our service levels and also to our staffing. Um, and then that led to sort of a new fee-based service model that was codified through the pricing and revenue policy adopted in um, 2009. Um, Neil at the time walked you through the department's efforts to ensure that we continue to provide access to our community, all communities, um, by focusing on increasing scholarship, um, the number of participants, as well as um, we increase the, the scholarship amount over the years. So we walked through that. Um, and then uh, finally, we walked you through sort of the comparison as it stood um, at that time in 2019 um, about how we're seeing um, our cost recovery targets and as well as fee activity and how that played out in um, our particular program and that was preschool. Um, and so we walked you through those examples and what we said at that time was that we wanted to reevaluate again, um, sort of our fees and then kind of hone in on those family friendly programs. Um, and this was all because we were also um, really reevaluating um, ourselves through the lens of Activate SJ. So you know we have our um, we have five pillars, and um, the work that we're doing now is really driven by the pillar of equity and access, where we commit to embracing people of all ages, cultures, races, um, and abilities, regardless of income um, or neighborhood. And in this section, we have two um, specific, we have a benchmark and two specific activities. Um, so this benchmark, what we call EA5, is um, ask, we, we, are, we are directing, um, we're directing ourselves to evaluate revenue generating programs, um, as well as attempting to increase our scholarship assistance. Again, all in an effort to increase equity and access. And then you can see these two activities um, or how we how we plan to do that. So again, we're looking to to move this, and we would say that the the COVID experience um, of this year 
has really given some urgency um, around this. Um, so in addition to Activate SJ driving this, we also um, had uh, the council policy, education policy was adopted in February of 2020. And the education policy um, calls out, as stated in our memo uh, before you today, that um, the city needs to take consideration that the plans and programs that highlight children and families most in need of educational supports are also the most likely to face financial hardships. And so we wanna balance financial sustainability with, the, with affordability and access to our diverse community. So again, we are coming forward with um, our recommendations today to align with council adopted policy and the equity um, and access portion of Activate SJ. Um, so with that, I want to go through and walk you through a little bit about how the revenue um, and pricing policy is um, categorized. And again, we, we talked about this in 2019, and we have an update. Um, and before I turn it over to Dave, I really want to show how we have three categories. We have public, merit, and private. And you'll see on, if we start at the uh, private line, you'll see that a private uh, benefit means there's minimal to no general fund support or subsidy. And to date, we have programs such as preschool, rock or after school program, leisure classes, rentals for private parties, fitness membership and golf that are currently in that private category. And due to the adoption of the education policy, we are considering um, with the budget office whether or not it's feasible to move those programs into um, the merit category. So you'll see on the, on the merit row, you'll see that we're trying to consider whether or not recreation, preschool, rock, things such as swim lessons um, could be considered merit. And merit would mean that there's a cost sharing model that there's a balance between general fund support and fee activity. Um, and so again, we're trying to be responsive to council policy as well as balance um, the, the budget situation. So in addition to those uh, items under consideration, we also are looking at um, those programs that can be deemed public. And that means those programs that receive the highest level of community um, benefit and therefore um, the general fund subsidy, and we do not charge for that. So to date, those would be walking on trails, access to neighborhood parks, as well as our senior nutrition program. So again, what we're considering um, is moving things such as recreational swim, things that we know are a, a priority to, to council, as well as teen center memberships that have historically, they're such a nominal cost um, and some of our partners have come, uh, have come to support us in terms of county probation and things like that. We think these are the type of things that we would like to consider moving from merit to public. So we're starting the conversation and um, looking for your um, recommendations, your questions that we can move forward and, and discuss further with the budget office on whether um, it's feasible to move these things around and ha again, have um, budget support to do that. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave DeLong for further discussion. Yeah, hi, council members, Dave DeLong, interim division manager with PRNS. Uh, just to piggyback on uh, some of the things that Andrea has just uh, mentioned, just to do a recap, you know, in the mid 2000s, PRNS devoted a lot of time and energy and resources to scoping out a new approach to um, service sustainability. And, um, you know, at that time, we were able to see some budget deficits on the horizon. This is before the Great Recession. We really kicked it into high gear in order to come up with a philosophical framework by which we would um, determine how we were going to approach um, revenue generation and cost recovery. Uh, thinking about um, general fund subsidies or 100% cost recovery for things that um, maybe um, were of more of a private benefit, which Andrea alluded to. Um, this is the culmination of that effort, and um, Andrea did a good job of just running through kind of how we look at these different categories. But as you can see, our original valuations that we conducted may not align with the way 
um, we or the city council or the community see things today. And so, you know, that's really the discussion we're trying to have. We're trying to reconsider our approach to subsidization of the programs and services, uh, but knowing that there's a real impact to the city's bottom line, uh, though everyone may agree that um, revisions are due. So with that, you know, I'd like to just kind of talk at a high level about where we've been with respect to revenue generation, a couple comments on cost recovery, and then jump into an example to just kind of conceptualize the, the type of discussion we're trying to have today. So I think you've seen this, this, um, this slide before or this graph before. Basically it says that over the last 12 years, the department has generated over $200 million in revenue from our uh, fee activity and other revenue generating programs, which is an amazing thing, right? Because it alleviates the general funds burden with respect to our operating costs. What this graph doesn't show you though, is that you know we do have a systemic issue associated with um, our cost recovery efforts and it's this. Um, while we're seeing our revenues go up steadily over the years, right? And we've done a tremendous job with this revenue and pricing policy to make that happen. Um, our operating expenses continue to outpace our ability to increase revenues. And that's primarily due to just staffing costs. You know, they're, they're we, we can anticipate them. We know that they're coming. We can anticipate that, you know, they're gonna race away from us. Um, we do our best to take a look at our revenue generation efforts and adjust pricing in accordance with what the market will bear for individual types of programs and services. Um, we're also looking to see, you know, um, where is the threshold with respect to community access? That, that builds in a little bit of tension in the way that we approach this. So we're only able to increase pricing to some measure, right, to keep pace with the increasing expenses um, to the point that we can't, we can't exclude people because we've outpriced them from the market. Um, with that said, we do try to build our participation through our advertising and marketing efforts, and we do see some growth in our programs as we go from year to year. But it, again, it's not enough to, to, to make up for the difference in, in the growth and expense. Um, taking a look at that, um, you know, uh, we, can, we can show you at just in one facility uh, an example of, of, of some of the things that we're looking at. So um, we, pull, we decided to pull an example to show you um, what the dynamic in the conversation is. Um, looking at Roosevelt Community Center for 2018, 2019, these are actual numbers. And you can see at the top of this chart, we can see expenses um, for the fiscal year. And that includes general fund costs for operating the center, but also our PRNS fee activity costs for offering fee generating programs. The total expenses for that year was $1.8 million. Um, at the community center, we were able to generate different types of revenue, amounting to about a half a million dollars, making the overall net impact of the general fund about 1.3 million. Now, if we were to reconsider the way that we're looking at fee activity for some of the programs that um, we're really trying to encourage access and equity on, we're looking at preschool programs, after school programs, right? If we were to subsidize or highly subsidize or 100% subsidize um, those fee activity programs at this location, that would mean a loss of revenue of about $374,000 looking at 1819, which means that the overall adjusted general fund impact to just this facility alone would be 1.7 instead of 1.3 million dollars to the general fund. Now that just illustrates a point that you know for one location that is relatively small in the way of revenue generation. If you were to apply that across the board, we're talking about big money. And so what we wanted to point out that if we change our philosophical approach to some of the programs that we know that the community demands and that the community needs, it's going to have an impact to the general fund. So we wanted to illustrate that for you as we engage in this conversation. But in light of what we've experienced in the pandemic, I think we can see that, you know, there really is that demand out there. Uh, and if we were able to make our programs and services accessible from a pricing standpoint, from a scholarship standpoint, we would see greater participation and meet that need much better than we are now. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Hal, who's going to speak to that point in particular. Thanks, Dave. And thank you, Andrea. And uh, good afternoon, council members. Um, I wanted to, to walk you through um, some of our scholarship utilization that we've had um, this year and also through our programs. Also do a comparison of, of two of our community centers with similar amenities and then talk a little bit about what we've learned in operating our, our Rock and Learn program. So this first slide you see here is our um, scholarship utilization by zip code um, for the year 2020. Um, every registration, every participant that we've had in 2020 goes through our uh, registration system where we track uh, our scholarship um, 
amounts and scholarships by program and also gives us the ability to track by zip code. So in the year 2020, uh, we've issued out 927 uh, scholarships. And as you see from the graph below, it's from a wide range of, of zip codes. 29 zip codes are, are represented in, this, in these scholarships throughout the city of San Jose. And as you see the graph continue to rise, you can see the, the standard um, zip codes that we're, that we're used to seeing in, in a high need areas, all the way up to 115 scholarships represented in the 95122 uh, zip code. Uh, next slide. I uh, also wanted to piggyback um, off of Neil's presentation from last year, where he compared two um, community centers by program. We wanted to give a comparison of two community centers um, and what they offer in a typical non-COVID year. Um, these two community centers, Almaden and Roosevelt, are very similar in size and amenities. Uh, the main difference being Almaden has a basketball gymnasium where Roosevelt does not but everything else is fairly similar. So when you look at the um, offerings that they have, they're not too different, but when you start to look at the number of classes, the number of participants and the number of uh, scholarship uh, participants, that's where we see a big difference. So Camp San Jose, which is our signature camp program that we offer in the summer, it's offered at both. Rock, which is our after school program that we offer, um, is only offered at Almaden and not at Roosevelt. And the biggest reason for this is um, what Andrea touched on a little bit about um, the three categories that we have. Rocket is tied to our cost recovery model and, and fee activity. Um, and the majority, if not all of the schools in the Roosevelt area are Title I schools that um, are available and eligible for uh, ACES funding, um, free after school programming. And our ROC program is not currently in that model. It is a fee-based program. And although we have scholarships attached, it's only at a 35% um, subsidy rate for those scholarships. Um, so those areas would not be able to afford uh, that program in, in, in the Roosevelt area. Fit Camp, which was a, a team program um, in the summer, also offered at both uh, team camps, uh, no at Almaden and yes at Roosevelt. The big disparity here with the number of leisure classes is while both have a leisure program and a leisure specialist attached to um, the staffing model at both community centers. Um, Almaden in, in 2019 offered 104 leisure programs, offered and ran 104 leisure programs, while Roosevelt only had 32. Um, again, leisure programs are tied to our fee activity uh, model and cost recovery model. And while they do have a, a scholarship attached to them, it's at a 75% rate. And we know that um, even a 25% um, cost for these programs can be a struggle and a barrier barrier for families in need. Um, and the same thing you see with specialty camps. So these are camps that are outside of our Camp San Jose and Fit Camp. Um, a lot of these camps are focused on a certain activity, like it'll be a three hour basketball camp or a three hour dance or piano class. You can see 56 um, offered at Almaden while only six um, offered at, at Roosevelt. And then uh, a huge disparity here in the number of unduplicated scholarship participants at Almaden. So while we know that there are more participants in these programs um, at Almaden, we also see a, a wide um, gap in the number of um, scholarship need and scholarship participants at Roosevelt, with that number being 408 um, versus uh, 168. Next slide. Can I? Can you just stop there for just a quick sure. second? Definitely. Uh, so uh, can you give me an example of what kind of classes are taking place uh, in your ROC program? So our rock programs are after school model that is uh, takes place on um, elementary, mostly elementary school campuses. We do have a few middle schools, but the majority are elementary. It's a program that runs from the school dismissal until 6 p.m. every day that school's in session, so 180 days. What we provide is homework support, uh, physical activity, and enrichment activities um, for students that are enrolled. So. It's like tutoring programs and. Uh... Yes, yes, we have trained staff um, with a one to 20 uh, ratio to student to staff um, that are able to assist with homework. So we usually break up the day. So a three hour day, a typical schedule would be the first hour they come in, have a snack, um, uh, finish their homework. If they don't have homework, they'll read. 
Uh, that will be followed by an outdoor activity, weather permitting. If it's not, we'll use um, you know, grounds on the school, the multi-purpose room, things like that. Um, followed by uh, an enrichment activity. So that might be a STEM activity, um, um, things to make the for science. They're participating in tech challenges, um, things like that throughout the year. And then again, usually followed up with another game or activity um, to, to increase that physical uh, participation for the students. And, and so if you could give me an idea of where Rock is taking place. Sure. Um, so typically, um, there's six community centers that Rock is housed in. Um, Almaden has four locations of Rock, so schools in the Almaden area. Um, Willow Glen has a Rock site um, in, in their area. Evergreen, uh, Berryessa, and Camden are the six community centers that operate Rock programs with their staffing out of their community centers. And all the schools are located very close uh, to those community centers. Mm -hmm. And uh, and these are these are taking place because you say that these are the cost recovery programs. Uh, I, I wouldn't say they're taking place because they're cost recovery. Um, they are part of our cost recovery program, and that's the challenge of offering them in locations such as a, a Roosevelt, a Mayfair, or a Seven Trees area because of the cost that's associated with it. What's the cost? So the, the typical cost um, ranges, I don't, I don't have it off the top of my head, I can get you the exact number, but it's about $2,000 for the nine month program. It comes out to, to roughly around two to $300 a month that a participant would pay, that a family would, would owe per child. And then the scholarship that's attached to that reduces that fee by 35%. So while, it, while it's a, a good scholarship, um, to have a family still have to pay 65%, especially in the areas that we're talking about would still be a large amount. So, so you said it was between two and $300 per month. Yes. Uh, so, so what is it? 200 or 300? What, what is that? Cause I want to know what I'm, I want to know after the scholarship, what, what the family's responsible for. It's about 272, but I can definitely email you the, the exact amount. Um, so 272 the that the family would end up paying after the scholarship amount, it's about 189, like in the 189 oh, to 189. Yeah. A month. Yeah. 189 a month for the for the child to be there from like 2.30 to 6 p.m.? Correct. Um, basically till the dismissal. So on early days, it's about 1 or 1.30. It, it equates to about 20 hours a week. Okay. And... Okay. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, and so this is our Rock and Learn program um, that we, I think you all are familiar with it, but I'll, I'll give you a brief a synopsis. We started this uh, program in August to support distance learning um, and for, for students that were struggling um, to log on to distance learning and also from areas that would not be able to afford a program or have the ability uh, internet access at home. Um, we, we targeted um, these students through our partnerships with the school districts through a referral system. So all of the students that are enrolled in Rock and Learn qualify for a scholarship. And, and the great part of Rock and Learn is the scholarship was at 100%. So no families have had to pay um, for our Rock and Learn program. And what we found early on um, when this program started in, in August was that the participation and the demand shifted from what we normally see for, from our programming. So the, the demand um, in the Roosevelt area, um, um, while it started with two or three classrooms, we kept seeing each week uh, more referrals coming in from Allen Rock Union School District, Unified School District, uh, places like Franklin McKinley. And we, keep, we kept having to increase um, our offerings in that area while at the same time seeing that a very small capacity, a very small percentage of, of families um, were requesting the service in our Almaden area. Um, so th what this slide shows is kind of a progression of enrollment um, versus, uh, from Almaden versus Roosevelt. As you can see, the first session at, Rose at Almaden didn't have any kids enrolled. Um, and in session five, which is the current session, only has 11 kids enrolled. While at Roosevelt, that number continued to grow to where we're at now at 48 kids enrolled, and that's max capacity. We have 48 kids at Roosevelt, and we have a capacity of 48. 
So what we've seen is that demand continue to increase as, as COVID has dragged on. And what our department has done is continue to increase the offering at Roosevelt and surrounding areas. So we've um, started this program at neighboring libraries like Carnegie Branch. We have it at Welch uh, Community Center. We have it at, at Hillview Library, Mount Pleasant, all the areas uh, that are supporting those school districts. And we continue to see that demand um, increase in those areas and the capacity reach 100% um, in those areas. And that's definitely something that we've talked about as a department for the last two or three years, knowing that that this cost recovery and the cost of our programs can be a barrier for families. And if we were able to increase either A, scholarship opportunities or reduce fees, we know there's a demand for our programs. And that's you know, one, one positive that we can see coming out of COVID is this was, this was proved in our application of, of Rock and Learn and in this program. So, so the, the Rock program is taking place currently in, in some of these other areas. Yes, Rock and Learn is actually uh, represented at 35 pods throughout the entire city. So there's parks locations, community locations, and um, library locations. The majority of them are in the areas that we were talking about here, the Roosevelt's, the Seven Trees, the Mayfair's, the Hillview Branch Library, all in the, the concentration of those zip codes that we were talking about with the scholarship need. Um, there are um, Rock and Learn at uh, Berryessa and at at uh, Almaden, just not as many, and also Willow Glen. Um, and also, every, like I said before, every participant that is enrolled in Rock and Learn is scholarship eligible and in need and has obtained a scholarship. If I can add a point of clarification, uh, Vice Chair, um, Hal was talking about the Rock program generally on the slide before. That's the after school program that you were getting the pricing on. Rock and Learn is an all day learning pod to support virtual distance learning. So it's a unique program for us. It's not something we would normally do, but because we're doing it, we're able to pull some data from it and be able to share that with you. But presumably, I mean, once the, once the pandemic is over and kids go back to school, we, don't ha we won't have to do rock and learn. And then we would shift back to doing rock after school programs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, John. Yeah, and, and that's a good point too. We, we, in normal times, we actually wouldn't even be allowed to operate this program. Um, we are under a, a waiver um, through the state of California to be able to offer a full day um, child care type program during school hours. But typically as a license exempt organization, we wouldn't even be allowed to, to be offering this program. So it is definitely COVID related. Next slide. Okay. So um, I think that was some pretty compelling information and we just want to wrap it up and um, really let you know that our next steps um, are to address some of these key questions, right? How do we um, address the disparities um, as well as ensure equitable access to our recreation and our education programs that we know provide safe, stable and um, supportive environments for our children and families and we want to do that through reviewing the public private merit categories with the city manager's office and then again assess the feasibility as we walk through um, the budget process which um, believe it or not is starting already um, for um, fiscal year 21 22 um, but we know that there's great uncertainty um, with the financial health as we get through covid so this is going to be probably a, a month's long um, process to determine um, how and if we can get to moving these programs around in public private merit. And so with that, uh, we'll turn it back to the council. Thank you. Thank you. Let me see if there's anyone that'd like to speak from the public. Mr. Beekman. Hi, thank you. Um, as these were school related issues and, and issues to do with parents and their kids, uh, I hope you can have a little patience uh, in me trying to speak at this time. Um, you know, I've mentioned the idea a few times that, uh, you know, this, this process it, it can be like a schoolyard in a way, and we're all kind of kids in a way. 
And if you're respectful to the process, you know, I, I hope this can be a place to, uh, you're forgiving. You can be forgiving when, when like a person in the schoolyard, they offer their ideas and, and the other kids go, well, that's, that's okay. That's kind of good. Thanks. You know, so, I mean, I, I kind of do that and I'm a little flaky. So thank you for your patience with myself. Uh, but to explain in our public process, once again, it's very much my feeling that uh, with this upcoming next few years, you know, we're in kind of a, a, an extraordinary, strange set of circumstances. And it's kind of a time of emergency. And to try to paraphrase uh, Councilperson Esparza's words, uh, a council a few days ago, you know, there's a time that we practice, you know, our good practices as a country and how we respect how we work and do business. But in times like this, this is kind of a time of emergency and we have to really, you know, consider creative ideas to help each other out and work together, really work together and not pit each other against each other at this time. Even with practices that are traditionally what we always stand by and live by. And we have to be open to creative ideas and creative funding ideas that can honestly really help and just offer a really good community support and economic support at this time. And it takes effort to learn how to do that. And I, and I hope we can make those efforts. And I'd like to, uh, yeah, I think that's about all for now. So thanks a lot for your patience and hearing me out on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beekman. I'm going to turn to my council colleagues, starting with council member Esparza. Thank you. Um, I, uh, this is great. I mean, this, the, I know it's a reflection of a lot of work. Um, it, it feels long overdue. Um, and, uh, and I think, I suppose it's a silver lining to some of the ways that we've had to adapt that we have um, information statistics that we can share and learn from as a city to show that if we can provide some assistance, um, people will come, that it really is, it really is money that's preventing people from using facilities that their our tax dollars have paid for. And to me, this goes to the principles of equity. I know when the equity idea was introduced last year, it was to uh, it was to support the equitable distribution of city resources and services and to bridge the gap between cities under resourced diverse communities and our pro more prosperous neighborhoods and to explore opportunities for bringing an equity lens to when determining these resources programming and access to neighborhood services um, would be in our diverse communities and so here we are um, with something that meets that need. Um, I think I talked a lot about last year, um, the idea of equity where the city um, invested money in building a swim center, a beautiful swim center. And I, at some point, once COVID's over, I invite my colleagues to come for a field trip because mm -hmm. it has a really a toddler pool and it's a, it's a really cool, facility in, um, in one of the city's poorest neighborhoods. And so that these pools went unused because no one in the neighborhood could afford what it costs to use it. And um, I know that we all want all of our facilities full. We, we know the needs that are in our neighborhood. We believe in having equity. The whole city council unanimously um, voted uh, for, not just to create the Office of Equity, but we voted unanimously, thankfully, um, on an equity pledge that everyone here believed in it. Um, and a big part of that was offering a brighter future for our children um, and their families. And this is a big step to that. Um, so I'm, I'm, uh, I endorse it wholeheartedly because I think we need to fill every center, every facility in our city should be full of children and families, just full. That's what they're for. Um, and I had um, a couple of things in the interest of time. 
um, that I wanted to ask or point out. So two things I wanted to point out, and then I have a couple of questions. So one is, I'm gonna make my plug, the city council voted um, to do some work around a bond that we will be voting on next year. Um, and I think um, things like this show that we need facilities um, equitably distributed throughout our city as well. Um, when PRNS did a presentation, I think it was this year before COVID, honestly, I have COVID brain and my, my sense of memory and time is a little shot from before COVID and after COVID. Um, but PRNS did an amazing presentation with GIS mapping and um, all of that. Um, but there are parts of the city that are under-resourced even today. And so we can talk about programs and we can talk about facilities um, that either way, we need a bond, we need additional revenue as a city, and it should not be coming from our poorest families that need us the most. Um, so uh, two things. One is um, you mentioned the preschool, um, and that really reminded me actually of that amazing PRNS presentation where scholarships pay, play a huge role in um, who can participate in these programs, but so does the programming, right? Whether it's a half day or a full day, how we design them, people that are uh, hourly workers or people that are working two or three jobs to make ends meet don't have the type of flexibility um, that uh, that someone in Almaden Valley might have where they, you know, three or four hours a day is enough for them, right? And so my question is, are we also, I know this is scholarships, but are we also looking at how we design some of our programming, including some of the programs that were quoted today to allow lower income or hourly wage folks to participate in the programs? Can I ask a point of clarification? Are you sure? Are, are you are you focused on participation due to due to the length of time? Meaning, are we are we discussing all day preschool daycare? All that's all an example. Day? That's an example. Yeah. So and 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 I bring this up because this was what we talked about before in that presentation before COVID was that all day you know there are people that would participate but a half day program is not it's just not going to cut it if you're you know you're yeah. not, particularly yeah. if you're a blue collar worker that doesn't have that much flexibility so yeah. so i agree i'm all in on scholarships i want every facility full in our city but i also think how we design some of these programs also affects there's an equity lens in how we design them we have some frankly, experts on our own city staff um, that could offer that insight into um, adding some of, some more equity in terms of the hours that we um, that we offer. So uh, so yes, we have been having those conversations. In fact, uh, Council Member Arenas couldn't be here today. This is a particular passion of hers as well. Um, so we, you know, we when we adopted uh, the new standards um, for early education, um, that meant we needed to adopt new standard classifications for the people delivering the programming. Um, but also, um, we started looking at what are some grant opportunities out there at the state level to help support expanded preschool. But I will tell you that ultimately, when we look at it, there's there's there are a lot of hurdles to getting to all day preschool daycare five days a week. They're not insurmountable, but one of the biggest hurdles will be the cost, um, and especially if we want to do it free. And so ultimately, I think we need to have this conversation through priority setting because the, the breadth and, and the size and the amount that it would take to do that, they're big. Um, and that, that's not saying we can't do it. We just have to make that decision as a city. Um, so at some point, we'll probably get to that conversation. I don't know. I don't know if Angel knows when we're doing priority setting next again. Um, but, but just the sheer size of, of, of doing that, of making that transition, uh, I think warrants that discussion. That said, we fully support the idea. We, we agree. We as a city should be figuring out a way to do this. 
and we agree that it's not convenient to have preschool be, you know, for three hours, three days a week in the morning. Um, it's not that convenient for a lot of people. Uh, it's a lot more convenient to start at the beginning of the day and come pick your kid up at the end of the day. Um, so Angel, I don't know if you have anything to comment on priority setting. setting. Um, yeah, no, I, I think priority setting is one avenue. You know, the recommendation today is really centered around at least starting this conversation through this budget year uh, process, just given the impacts that COVID is having. But, but John is right. I mean, this is a big volume of work, even to get to that 0 21 around the price, um, the, the, the pricing memo that did take a good 18 months to get to that point. And again, some context there, uh, that was all developed in response to um, the, the aftermath of the Great Recession, right? We had lost about 50% of PRNS staffing. Revenues were, were way down. And it was really, we had shuttered about 42 community centers. It, it, was, it was a way to basically just keep the, the department afloat and to make sure services were being provided. We learned a lot from there. And the, one, the, the biggest takeaway is that we know, and, and, and quite frankly, some of the biggest losers have really been certain communities that were already underserved to begin with. And we lost even more traction, right? And so I, I think staff has done a really good job of kind of framing the public policy question around, you know, we could really meet the moment in a more aggressive way and make sure that we're serving people, but there is a cost to it. And then we, we would need to kind of frame that conversation with the mayor and council to ensure that that becomes a priority because it definitely will have budget and fiscal implications uh, if, if we do that. And then I also want to remind us that, you know, when hard times come, usually PRNS and services provided by PRNS and the library are oftentimes the first to get cut, right? So sometimes, so we also have to kind of, you know, plan with that in mind as well, right? Because then we kind of set up the expectation that services will be available, and then they're the first to go uh, when, you know, times get hard. So those are all the kind of key, kind of some of the key red flags. As John said, they're not insurmountable, but I think we have to go into this with eyes wide open. Um, mm -hmm. I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. I, I, um, I, I the reason I bring up preschool and, and uh, you know, unfortunately, council member out in us, um, isn't here and I hope she recovers and comes back to us um, soon. Um, but, uh, but that example that was used earlier this year was seven trees. So, you know, and, and it's huge. The difference between the Almaden Valley utilization and seven trees is enormous. Yeah. And it has to do with the hours as well as the cost. Um, and, and, and those for me, for certain programs go hand in hand. And at the time I asked if we were talking to First Five and other partners in the community who can bring not just their expertise, but additional re their own and additional resources, right? We all know Jolene is a powerhouse um, and, uh, and amazing, but you know, we have talked, I have had conversations with her about leveraging other funding as well to do certain things um, I think we just need to have that conversation. I, I, I don't know what that is, but it is something that we need to address. Otherwise, these disparities around preschool are going to continue. Um, and, and as far as, um, you know, choices that we have to make, you know, we have had, this isn't PISFIS, this is NSE, but we have, as a city council, has have had a lot of discussions about what we put and where, right? We just uh, approved some uh, uh, urban area security initiative grants um, around technology for the police to use, right? We do, we do a lot, the police have been out, right? The police have been thankfully on the streets every day during COVID, right? What, where we need to get to as a community is where we are investing in these areas and not just thinking police, um, but that we are providing programs for parents to send their kids to so that their kids aren't, you know, getting up to no good while their parents are working two and three jobs, right? Like the, these programs are a lot more than buildings. They're, they're, and, and they're about families and neighborhoods and, and giving people better choices and opportunities in life. Right. So so I'm happy to have that discussion in council, but I just uh, wanted to bring that up today because I think we also need to start talking about how 
these programs impact our families and our neighborhoods. In fact, this Saturday with, with the uh, guidance of our county EOC, I'm gonna be out in a neighborhood that has had an increase in violence and we're gonna do some you know, COVID responsible activities, but we need to get out talking to families and children in a place where there's gunfire regularly, right? And so, but it's programs like this that are so much more than a child learning to read or learning how to play ball. Um, they can change a family and a neighborhood. And we also need to start talking about it that way um, because it's not just PRNS in a box. It's about choices that we make as a city that when we make choices in one way and we bring certain types of resources in one way that we also bring certain investments in neighborhoods in another way so we can just lift them up because we can't just arrest our way out of problems. We need to also invest in some neighborhoods in our community. I'll stop there. Thank you. If I could just um follow up on two things. Uh, one, Council Member Sparza, we have a deep relationship with First Five. Um, they have been walking alongside us and funding us um, as it relates to meeting the quality standards, investing in the curriculum, doing deep level training um, last year, and continuing it through COVID has been a phenomenal effort by staff. Um, so, you, you know, when, when we come back and, and discuss quality standards, in the spring, we were hoping to show the first year of pre and post tests. We were unable to do the post back in April, May, because we just didn't know what, what COVID, um, you know, we just had to stop meeting with our kiddos, but we picked it back up again um, at the beginning of this school year and started those pre-tests again. So that is all due to a, a deep relationship with First Five. Um, and then I, just the second thing I wanted to say was, as John talked about the cost, um, and, and the challenge is we can't forget that as a municipality, we are under the license exempt um, model. And so that's what really drives our hours. Um, so that's why we just need to, it's, it's also, what is that enabling legislation that would move us to become an all day? So there's a lot of moving parts <laughs> as it relates to this. So it's also that question of license versus license exempt. Thank you, and I'm happy to help with that, as I know Councilmember Arenas is as well. Thank you. Thank you for that, and I don't see, let's see, any other council colleagues of mine. I'll do one more sweep. Doesn't look like it. Councilmember um, Carrasco, if I could just um, give you an updated number um, that you were looking for for the cost of rock. Mm -hmm. um, so the exact uh, amount for a monthly payment for a non-scholarship family is 264 per month. And for a scholarship eligible family, it's 172. 172. So um, I'm just, and it's 20 hours a week. Roughly, I mean, it, it, it could vary um, based on the mm -hmm. school bell schedule of the different schools that we're in. We're in six different school districts across the um, city of San Jose. Um, but yeah, it can, it can range between 17 to, to 20 hours a week, depending on that, that bell schedule. Yeah, well, th th you know, I I'm gonna make it brief so we can uh, get on with the other um, presentation. Um, and, and I have a, another, uh, another engagement coming up soon. I just wanted to let everybody know about it. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it's a little surprising. I have to just be very transparent. When, when you describe the, the program Rock, it's the kind of program that's so ideal. And you know this, I'm preaching to the choir. There's nothing, nothing new, nothing, uh, you know, this isn't rocket science. When you think of after school, homework support programs, you know, and you think of the achievement gap, the educational gap, the opportunity gap, and you look at, uh, at schools on, on the east side and you look at all the different zip codes, I don't need to get into all of that. You're working in, in those zip codes. You, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I've got, you know, several council members on here. They know what I'm talking about. Um, 
you know, some of us have been on school boards and what fueled us to get on the school boards was exactly those, uh, those statistics. And when you talk about, you know, STEM activities and we're in the middle of Silicon Valley and you go, that's exactly what we want to expose our kids to. And we, we work so hard to figure out how do we expose our kiddos to STEM activities or STEAM activities? How do we uh, expose them to things that uh, otherwise they wouldn't be able to be exposed to because their families can't, uh, can't acquire those, uh, those opportunities. They don't have the funding or they don't have the knowledge or they just don't have the access or they're too busy, they're working, uh, or they simply just don't know because they don't know. They don't know what they don't know. And, uh, and so when I look at you know, what you just gave me, $264 for a family in Almaden Valley to pay for, uh, for an after-school program, that comes out to $3.30 an hour for an enrichment program, which is tutoring and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, when I've had to turn to a tutor to help my kids with math or, or biology, I've had to pay up to $75 for that kind of support. And that's once a week, because that's all I can afford. And I, I just want to give you that context. And I've had to really sacrifice some other things in order to be able to give them the once a week support that kind of left us like, was that even a good tutor? Like, I don't know, was it? We'll see how that goes with the grades. And so, you know, there's gotta be a better way to be able to provide this for the, the uh, for all our, our kids in those zip codes that are really lagging behind. We've got to figure out this formula. And then in terms of the preschool, you know, I've said it before at council, I was a mom that was struggling that almost got fired because I actually put one of my, my kiddos in uh, preschool, the youngest one, and uh, she was in a three-day preschool for three and a half hours. And I had to rush out of, out of work in order, it was the most inconvenient. It, it doesn't take a mom into account. And I didn't even have an expectation that it would be a full day, but it was three days a week. It was just, it, it felt very insensitive and it was very frustrating. And it was, I did it more for my child in order for her to get stimulation and get out of the house. Uh, but it felt like, like you were really forcing my hand in terms of uh, uh, being able to provide a simulating experience uh, and, and having to choose between my daughter and my job. I, I almost got fired because of it. And so I just, I just want us to keep that in mind. And when I look at the hours being offered in other centers, uh, it, again, it's this sense of inequity. And you all know about equity because you fight for it as well. I know you are, you're our partners in it. And so we, again, I don't want this to go to priority setting. I don't think that this is a priority setting item. I think this is an administrative item that we need to figure out in terms of how we, how we move our numbers and how we make those work for our centers and for our most vulnerable communities. I don't think that this is a priority setting item. So we need to put our heads together to, to figure that one out. So, uh, the last thing I'll say is uh, that last graph that you showed, uh, the rock and roll, or not the rock and roll, sorry, what's it called? Rock and learn. Rock and learn? Yeah. It's, uh, uh, there's no better graph than that one to illustrate how uh, you build it and they will come. Uh, our families are ready ready to rock and roll in a rock and learn type of environment, you build it, they'll come. 
Mm-hmm. They're they're ready. They're hungry. They're uh, they're open. And especially if you have a good quality program, uh, they're ready to be fed. And so we want to make sure that we're feeding them the right kinds of nutritional type of programs. And what I mean by that is we got to feed their their minds with the right stuff. So, uh, you know, good quality programs is what we need in these in these neighborhoods, especially again, I'm going to constantly now look through the lens of COVID, pre-COVID versus now post-COVID. So now everything is going to be through the lens of COVID. Is COVID is just going to ravish our communities, just ravish our communities. And so what are we going to do to make sure that these kiddos are not being left behind in, in the, in, you know, when the waters recede, the waters of COVID recede, and we make an assessment and we take inventory and we suddenly realize all the devastation that it leaves behind. And I'm not just talking about the health devastation, but the devastation that it leaves for all of us who are locked up in our own home and suffering through mental health issues and, and now academic um, decline and et cetera, et cetera. And so um, we've got to look through it through that lens of, of, uh, of COVID and how it, it discriminates uh, and, and just targets our communities, has a bullseye right on our community. So do you need action from us on this one? I had one more question, sorry. Oh, okay, I yes, Council no, Member. Uh, and I'll, uh, so my question is, so the next steps are, this comes back to us in the budget policy, correct? So we'll get, see this, this will next come before us in the budget process, correct? Uh, presuming, presuming administratively we advance st- more scholarship money or some programming, you know, there's a process we go through to, to get to what's presented to you, but this would definitely be the next place to address it, whether we address it as administration or you wanted to address it as a council. You know, our, our intent is to try to address this. But again, as we mentioned early on, the budget ahead of us is very uncertain. We don't know what we're going to get yet. We don't even know what targets we may or may not have. So I just we just can't commit 100% that something's going to be there in front of you through the administration. But I can commit that we are going to try. OK, so, so then. Um, given that I, I'll move to accept the report, but have this come back to us um, with some status since um, the third category is the budget process. And I think this uh, committee should get an update before that. What, the what would you like an update on? I, there, and there's not a just, lot. Just on where it is in the budget. Pro- like, I want to know if this, I, I don't, I don't want to wait until you know we get our binders that that this you know what the status of this is. I'm going to have to give a little deference here to Angel. Yeah, on. So, so let me so let, let me weigh in here. There's a couple of ways we can go. We we could bring okay. this back. We could bring this back to NSC for a check-in, or what we could do is uh, take the recommendation and the presentation and and the ones that, in my opinion, are the most. Have, have the ability to have the most traction are the recommendations to move some of these specific programs from private to merit. Because the way that works internally is that we would have to review that when you look at 0-21, which is the pricing and revenue policy, there's a percentage of cost recovery that's associated with each of those, a, a public type of program, a merit program and a private one. The recommendation before you today is staff is saying, let's we're, they're recommending to move some of these items such as preschool, rock and learn and so forth, uh, swimming uh, to um, uh, 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 merit classification. That review can be done internally and then could also be then turned into a, either an MBA through the budget process, which they could be reviewed and analyzed by you all and the council during that budget process. Uh, so that would that would probably be the the, the most efficient way because now we could turn this into an actual budget referral that's reviewed and then uh, staff can do the analysis and then come back with a more solid recommendation around what is the fiscal impact of this. Uh, and then you'll be able to evaluate that fiscal impact in the context of other competing interest and the budget situation at that time. Um, so, that, that, so those are really the two options. Do you have a preference for either one of those? One is coming back to NSC 
The other one is referring this analysis to the budget process for further consideration. So I'm, I'm happy to refer it to the budget analysis for further consideration, which is what the, the right, the third bucket that you did. I, I think that this does need to come back to NSC. We need to have some discussion about that, this. Um, the council is going to be reviewing a lot of things. I don't ever want to go back to 2009 where we put buildings before people, particularly buildings before poor people. And I think that um, we're going to have a lot. And I think at least the folks that um, are on NSC should be able to be able to go more in depth on this issue um, before or before or as it comes to the full council. So I'll leave that to you, Angel, um, because I know timing becomes an issue and I don't want that to get um, in between it. I guess, I hope you hear what I'm saying, which is yeah. yep. we need to be updated. We need to have that discussion because we are going to have a lot of priorities and I don't want our kids and seniors and families to get lost in what's about to happen. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a good point. So, so why don't we do this? Um, what, what, you know, we'll go back and we'll, we'll, we'll figure out what is the most expedient way. I think there's a possibility for us to maybe do, even if it's a verbal update or a high level update, perhaps I'm looking at the agenda, perhaps in April, the April agenda, uh, and then on a parallel track, refer this perhaps through your motion here uh, to the budget process. And that way, you know, there's coordination through NSC for additional input. And then on a parallel track, this goes to the full budget process for a review. Uh, and then that way, we don't lose any time between now and the, the adoption of the next budget. Uh, I think that would be probably the most expedient way of, of approaching this. It addresses both issues. It gets input from NSC. And at the same time, it puts this on the radar of the budget uh, process. Okay, I'm fine with that to have the NSC and I'll read the PowerPoint as opposed to the memo because that the uh, PowerPoint calls for the review plus the budget assessment and so and to move to recommend moving this forward. So that that will, will be the motion plus this comes back to NSC in April. Is, is that your motion? Yes. Okay, do I get a second? Second. Okay. Got a second. Uh, Madam Clerk. Jimenez. Yes. Foley. Aye. Esparza. Yes. Crosco. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we'll see you back in April. Uh, and moving on to, I believe it's our our city council policy priority number 12, flavored tobacco and e-cigarettes. And uh, I believe we have a presentation on that. Yes, yeah, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, this is Rosalind Huey, uh, Director for Planning, Building and Code Enforcement. And um, we are glad to be before the committee this afternoon to actually provide you um, status oh. report on two city council priority items. The first one um, is flavored tobacco and e-cigarettes, um, as well as protecting our youth from the e-cigarette epidemic. So this afternoon, um, we will be providing um, information on our scope for our work plan. Uh, we'll be sharing uh, some of the items, the actions that we have completed, um, as well as sharing with you what our next steps will be. So with that, I am going to actually turn the presentation over to Oscar Carrillo. He is our interim division manager in code enforcement. So Oscar. Thank you, Rosalind. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Carrasco and committee members. Uh, my name is Oscar Crillo. I am the Interim Code Enforcement Division Manager, and I'm here to present the status report on Council Priority Number 12, Flavored Tobacco and E-Cigarettes and Protecting Our Youth from the E-Cigarette Epidemic. In support, alongside me, are Joyce Villalobos, Community Intervention Lead with the Santa Clara County Public Health Department, as well as Leslie Zellers, Policy Consultant with Santa Clara Public Health Department. Uh, next slide, please. I'll start with a little bit of background. On September 25th, 2019, 
Rules and Open Government Committee approved the recommendation to refer the three items. One, develop an ordinance to prohibit the sale of flavored tobacco products and electronic cigarettes. Two, explore policies to limit further over-concentration of retailers. And three, remove the tobacco retail license exemption for 18 and over retailers. This was approved to be set for council priority se setting session for fiscal year 2020. 2021. On February 25th, 2020, during Council Policy Priority um, Session, uh, the previous proposal put forward by Council Member Carrasco was combined with the proposal put forth by Council Member Foley and was added to the Council Priority List as Priority Number 12, the flavored tobacco and e-cigarettes and protecting our youth from the e-cigarette epidemic. Um, Further on the background, I'm very proud to report that we were awarded a grant through the Santa Clara County Public Health Department to help fund our efforts. These funds originate from state Prop 56 and Prop 99 tobacco tax revenues and are distributed through the Santa Clara County Public Health Department. We were awarded a little over $120,000 to reimburse the cost of staff resources expended to carry out this council priority. Part of our efforts are to align our ordinance with existing federal and state legislation. In particular, Senate Bill Number 7, which increased the minimum sale age from 18 to 21, and the most recently passed Senate Bill 793, which bans flavored tobacco products. Signatures are currently being counted on a referendum that would delay the implementation of Senate Bill 793 until November 2022, at which time there will be an initiative on the ballot to repeal the law. Now, this does not preclude local jurisdictions from implementing strict, stricter restrictions. Um, next slide we are on. Yes. So now we're going to move into the work plan items, um, specifically the research and benchmarking with other jurisdictions. We looked at and continue to look into prohibitions on sale of tobacco products near schools and other retailers. We're also looking at how other jurisdictions provide legal non-conforming status for businesses selling tobacco prior to any ordinance changes, as well as criteria to revoke legal non-conforming status, such as failure to renew their permit in a timely manner or potentially a change in ownership. We also looked at a potential six month grace period for businesses that may be required to close or to deplete current stock of newly prohibited products. Uh, next slide, thank you. So some of the data that we uh, gathered, uh, we utilized an online mapping tool developed by the Stanford Prevention, Prevention Research Center and Green Info Networks to estimate how many businesses fell within either 500 feet or 1,000 feet from schools. 68 businesses were identified to be within 500 feet of a school and 188 businesses were determined to be within 1,000 feet of a school. We are still working on gathering data around retailer to retailer proximity, as well as trying to get a breakdown on how this impacts each individual council district. Some of the draft amendments to Title 6.87 that we're, we are looking into currently are prohibiting the sale of flavored tobacco and e-cigarettes and other products, including menthol flavored products, which would align with recently passed state regulations. We're also looking at setting proximity limits for new retailers increasing the minimum sale age from 18 to 21, as well as removing all license exemptions. Currently, retailers that prohibit people, persons under the age of 18 are exempt. While, we'd, while we would increase the age of sale to 21, we would still like to remove exemptions for retailers that prohibit customers under the age of 21. We're also looking to define legal non-conforming requirements as well as establishing a grace period and overall, this is all going to align our municipal code with state and federal regulations. On the other side of the slide, you can see some of the potential impacts. Um, please note that pending this referendum, the 12 vape only stores would not be required to close. Even if the law went into effect on January 1st, those stores may still limit the type of products that may be sold and change their business models to, in order to implement any changes. Uh, now for our next steps. Next slide, please. Um, we're going to continue to complete the work plan items, including research, data, and analysis, and as well as stakeholder outreach. We're going to coordinate with the city attorney's office and the public health department to develop purport, proposed ordinance amendments for consideration by the end of fiscal year 2020-2021. 
We're also gonna assess and develop budget and fee proposals as appropriate for additional resources needed to support the new tobacco retail license program as part of the annual budget process for fiscal year 2021-2022. We also continue to coordinate with our internal and external partners to assess our role in effective ways to curb online sales to underage customers. For reference, uh, Senate Bill 39 went into effect January 2020 that expanded and refined the regulations around online tobacco sales. This bill, this bill updated the Stake Act, uh, or known as the Stop Tobacco Access to Kids Enforcement Act, and include items such as delivered products must be in clearly marked containers, and also requiring the signature of a person over 21 years of age upon delivery. And with that, I am open to any questions or discussion. Thank you. If you allow me, let's see. I believe we have a number of folks who are interested in speaking. Uh, let's start with Ms. Margot Seidner. My apologies if I've mispronounced your name. You're good. <laughs> that was correct. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, council members, committee, and staff. Um, I'm Margo Seidner, the CEO of Breathe California of the Bay Area, Golden Gate, and Central Coast. And I'm here today to urge you to forward the report on flavored tobacco and e-cigarettes with the recommendation for the tobacco retail license to the full council for action. Breathe California was founded in San Jose in 1911, and we work to prevent tobacco use and its damages. I spoke to the rules committee in fall 2019 about this, and also we weighed in on the prioritization meeting earlier this year. But now I want to emphasize the new urgency of this matter. Um, since Big Tobacco was successful in its efforts um, to get a ballot measure and the state's uh, SB 793 will now not go into effect until after November 2022 election, um, local jurisdictions must act to prevent the millions of youth from getting hooked by flavored tobacco. Um, in over 30 years of tobacco control work, this youth tobacco use epidemic is the worst I have ever experienced. Um, it is made even uh, worse by tobacco retailers who are near schools and other factors that were just shared with you. Um, and as you have already noted several times in this meeting, COVID affects everything. So youth who get COVID and if they are smoking will suffer more severe consequences. So I want to urge you to send this to the council and um, thank you for your services at this crucial time. Thank you so much, Ms. Margo. Uh, next speaker is Mr. Brian Davis. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Brian Davis, and I'm a member of the Tobacco Free Coalition of Santa Clara County. Thank you, council member Carrasco, for your leadership. I remember the powerful personal story you told at a rules committee hearing in 2015 that helped to move forward a proposal to end the distribution of free e-cigarettes and one pack for one buck tobacco coupons in San Jose. Today, a similar issue lies before this committee protecting youth from e-cigarette devices and flavored tobacco products, including menthol cigarettes that make it easier to get addicted to nicotine and harder to quit. One thing to recognize is that underage youth are getting e-cigarettes from retailers. A study from the Truth, Truth Initiative in 2018 showed that 74% of youth surveyed were getting dual e-cigarettes from physical retail outlets and only 6% were getting them online. Also, 34.9% of tobacco and vape shops in California sold to underage decoys in 2018. So when store owners tell you that they are only selling to adults, keep this information in mind. 
Nearly 50 jurisdictions throughout the Bay Area have voted to end sales of flavored tobacco products, and the vast majority have chosen not to exempt menthol or so-called adult-only stores. The state of California has done the same, and were it not for the tobacco industry funded referendum, which will qualify, they have plenty of signatures, sales of flavored tobacco products would have ended statewide next month. Please take this information under consideration. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next uh, is Ms. Bonnie Halpern Felsher. Actually, that name just dropped off. Ms. Uh, Mr. Brian, did I already call Brian Davis? Yes, Mr. Davis just spoke. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, next up is Shrikar Shintala. Uh, good afternoon, all. My name is Shrikar Shintala, and I'm a legislative ambassador for the American Cancer Society. Um, for the sake of my school duties, I'm going to be combining my requests both for the tobacco policy and the smoke free housing policy. Um, I would like to start off by talking about how someone I, I knew or no, had their lungs collapsed from excessive smoking. Um, he was 15 at the time and he had to stay hospitalized for almost three months. Uh, he didn't show up to school for that entire period and many of us were worried sick. And we can only imagine how his family felt as well. And this is not okay. Tobacco and smoking has the, pow the power to take away children from their families and we cannot let this happen. We urge that the council make the existing tobacco retailer license policy a strong ordinance by including key provisions to protect the youth of our community. To be more specific, we want four provisions. We want to ban all flavored tobacco products, including hookah in all locations. We want to restrict e-cigarette and vape product sales. We want to restrict the density of tobacco retailers near schools and existing retailers. And finally, we want to eliminate the adult only store exemption. Why would we want to risk the lives of so many with such poison? Furthermore, we urge the council to move forward with the, with the comprehensive policy that protects all San Jose multi-unit housing residents, including duplexes, apartments, condos, and townhomes. Remember, all smoke is smoke and is harmful, regardless if it's from cigarettes, vape products, or marijuana. There are often many children that live with their families in these type of uh, multi-unit houses. And the last thing we want is them to develop these diseases due to the secondhand smoke. Uh, thank you for your time, and I hope you take these into consideration. Thank you so much. Um, Agam Rup Kaur. Uh, hello. Hi. Okay, hi. Um, hello, my name is Agam Rup. I'm representing the Stanford Tobacco Prevention Toolkit Youth Action Board. I wanted to say that I believe it's vital for San Jose to take action because of how easily accessible items like e-cigarettes and other tobacco are to the youth. Many stores carry extremely enticing advertisements that are placed outside these shops and especially near schools are really attracting a large amount of youth. Plus on top of that, with not being screened for ID, youth are very easily able to get a hold of such products. Therefore, I support these proposed regulations to make sure accessibility is limited and in turn protect youth from the ep epidemic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Vanessa Marvin. Vanessa Marvin. Hi again, Vanessa. Hi there. Oh. oh, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Hi. Hi, council members. My name is Vanessa Marvin, and I'm a San Jose resident in District 6 and a parent of kids. In addition, I'm here speaking as the co chair of the Tobacco Free Coalition of Santa Clara County which consists of organizations and individuals who care about the tobacco issue, including healthcare agencies, hospitals, local nonprofits, community agencies, and residents. First of all, I wanna thank Vice Chair Carrasco for your work on this issue for the past year and Council Member Foley for highlighting this issue in the prioritization process. Now we're here urging you to continue to move forward to strengthen your laws around selling tobacco, e-cigarettes, and especially flavored tobacco products in the city of San Jose. We heard in the hearings as part of the prioritization process and probably will hear today and moving forward in council, 
a lot of comments that say parents should simply just stop their kids from vaping. We shouldn't regulate stores. But I think anyone who has any experience with teenagers knows that teens are less and less focused on the words their parents say and more on the outside influences. So we need to work together as a community to help parents and not just point fingers at them. As a reminder, back in November 2018, the Surgeon General and the FDA declared youth e-cigarette use an epidemic in the United States. So to tackle this epidemic, we need to work together to protect our young people, just as we would for any other harmful product that would ruin their lives. In addition, I want to remind you that despite what people may say as part of this process, these are not, the vape products are not FDA approved quit smoking devices. It is in fact our coalition partner organizations who work diligently to provide cessation services to our community and not the vape stores. Our coalition has worked with other communities across the county who have already stepped up to protect their residents from these harmful products. Santa Clara County, Cupertino, Los Altos, Altos Los Gatos, Palo Alto and Sunnyvale have all restricted flavored tobacco and seven cities in the county have banned the sale of vaping products in their city. We look forward to working with seeing San Jose join the ranks of these leaders in our county and pass a strong licensing law here in San Jose. Thank you. Anisha Munshi. Anisha Munshi. Please unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, members of the council. My name is Dr. Anisha Munshi, and I will be providing a public comment on behalf of Dr. Marianne Devon, Superintendent of Schools at the Santa Clara County Office of Education. The Santa Clara County of, Ed of Education is pleased to see the recommended actions proposed today to address the youth vaping epidemic. Santa Clara County Office of Education supports taking action on flavored e-cigarettes as one piece of the issue, but given that use of flavored tobacco products is widespread across all tobacco product types, combustible and non-combustible, regulations should be comprehensive to include all tobacco products. According to research by Stanford University, Puff Bar, the most popular disposable electronic cigarette among youth contains nicotine content found in about 2.5 packs of cigarettes. In Santa Clara County, 82% of teens currently using tobacco reported using a flavored product and 45% of teens reported purchasing their own e-cigarettes with over a quarter of this group saying they buy them directly from a local store. Nicotine is highly addictive and can harm the developing adolescent brain. Using electronic cigarettes and vape products can lower your immune response to infections and increase the chances of worst outcomes from COVID-19. In fact, a recent study found that youth and young adults who use both e-cigarettes and cigarettes are up to seven times more likely to get COVID-19. Students may experience withdrawal symptoms, and these may include irritability, headache, uh, feeling sad or down and anxious. Santa Clara County Office of Education offers our full support to assist the city in moving forward with these efforts. We have a joint responsibility to protect our youth. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Munshi. Mr. Beekman. Hi, thank you. Um, these are issues that have been dating back uh, for quite a while. And uh, there was a very interesting uh, city, uh, I think rules and open government meeting, maybe back in uh, September of 2019 on overall uh, e uh, cigarette issues. And, um, you know, the, the flavored tobacco, I, I fully understand um, what you can work towards. And I think the overall efforts to end tobacco use is really important. And it's a lot as a city that you're taking on the, the to do that. So I thank you for that. And um, it, the argument was made that e-cigarettes do have a way to wean a person off of cigarettes themselves and maybe the future of e-cigarettes as is, is, is a prescribed use maybe that's uh something to think about for the future and i'm interested in in you know really to understand you know both sides of an argument and an issue and uh i think the the september 2019 uh city uh, rules and open government meeting is a way to do that 
it sounds like you've moved forward on the issue of how to work on it here in San Jose. And I congratulate yourselves for that. And, uh, you know, I think it's for the best. The, to work for better health is, is, is for the best. And uh, I think tobacco use was meant only for a very limited use in our lives, uh, special occasions. And uh, so good luck in, uh, in how we uh, develop uh, how, to, how to deal with this issue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Peekman. Taylor, oh, my apologies for the pronunciation or mispronunciation, sir. Taylor says Nojik. Hi, uh, it's Taylor Chasley. Oh, Miss Taylor. Yeah. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members and staff. My name is Taylor Chasnoy and I am an emerging community leader intern at Breathe California of the Bay Area and a student at Santa Clara University. I'm speaking on behalf of the emerging community leader team and as a student who has been exposed to the rippling effects of secondhand smoke. When I was a senior in high school, it was not uncommon to smoke nicotine. People would smoke in bathrooms during class, they would smoke in their cars at lunch, and they would smoke with their friends after school. One day the school realized the extent of this issue among the student population. Instead of trying to isolate the problem only among those who engage in smoking, the school felt the best solution was to monitor bathroom usage. This was a location where most students would vape, especially with others. As a result, only one to two students could use the bathroom at a time in a school full of 2,500 students. This drastically affected everyone's ability to learn as going to the bathroom would cause people to wait up to an hour in line during class time. Today, these people still suffer from a nicotine addiction. Even more unfortunate, people who were secondhand smokers before have now become deeply involved by engaging directly in vaping practices themselves. I have no doubt that this is not an uncommon occurrence in high schools in San Jose and across the nation. I have witnessed my close friends manage their life around their jewel or puff bar, and this was often ignited from just a single secondhand exposure to smoking. I urge you city council members to ban the sale of flavored tobacco products near all schools use sensitive areas and multi-unit housing. Through the mitigation of sales in these impressionable areas, it can help lower the likelihood of young people engaging in smoking practices and continuing to pe perpetuate the probability of other at-risk groups secondhand exposure. As a student that is on their way to enter the real world, my hope for the next generation is that they will never have to watch their friends slowly become addicted to nicotine right in front of their eyes and face the detrimental effects of secondhand smoking. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my experience and all the stories here today. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, next speaker is Amaya Wooding. Welcome. <coughs> Good afternoon, council members. My name is Amaya Wooding. I use she, her pronouns, and I co-chair Proudly Against Tobacco, the Bay Area's LGBTQ plus tobacco control coalition. Over 90% of people who smoke cigarettes daily started using tobacco when they were too young to legally buy it. For that precociousness, they get a lifelong nicotine addiction. That's serious, but it's entirely preventable. I think that anything that we can do to delay that first try or get it to never happen is a massive win, not only for that person's health, but also the health of their family and the health of their community. At the same time, LGBTQ youth first try tobacco at a lower age and at a higher rate than their peers. Why is that? Uh, it's stressful to be a young person who's different, especially if school or home or both uh, are unsupportive environments and tobacco is widely available as a coping mechanism. There is so much data out now on how the starter products of choice for young people are e-cigarettes and other flavored tobacco products. Most youth start with a flavored product and young people who have ever used an e-cigarette are up to seven times more likely to try cigarettes, the traditional combustible kind, relative to those who have never used an e-cigarette. So if you put away these products, you block the pipeline and you'll save lives later on. And as a final note, I do remember when this item was brought up last September and I'm very happy that it's made it this far. Thank you, especially to council member Carrasco and your staff uh, for dedication to community health and equity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amaya. Uh, Natalie Andrade, welcome. Hi, hi everyone, hi. Uh, dear council members, um, my name is Natalie Andrade and I work for the Santa Clara County Office of Education Peace Prevention Education Program. I am also a San Jose resident. Um, I would like to a letter on behalf of our peer advocate advisory council member who couldn't be here today due to school. However, she gave me permission to read the letter. Dear council members, my name is Ira Gupta and I am a 15 year old resident of San Jose. 
I attend Evergreen Valley High School and I'm a member of the Peer Advocate Advisory Council or PAC. I urge you to protect young people by strengthening your tobacco retailer licensing laws and restrict flavored tobacco products in the city of San Jose. Imagine, you decide to go to your school's bathroom. When you step inside, you immediately smell a mix of both a fruity and smoky substance. It's the smell of a flavored vape product. But how are youth even getting these products? Social media is not only good for staying in touch with your friends, it's also good for getting harmful and potentially addicting tobacco products. Teens can also get products from local dealers or even share products with their friends. During this challenging time, students sharing tobacco products is even more harmful even than it already is and can help spread the coronavirus. As a high schooler and even as a middle schooler, I have seen and heard many of my peers using flavored tobacco products. Using these products in school not only harms the user's education, but harms the education of those around them as well. Besides nicotine being harmful to the developing brain, students leave class or their activities to go use a tobacco product and it's usually a flavored one. Most young people who have used tobacco started with a flavored product. The tobacco industry creates flavors such as lychee and other traditional and cultural flavors to attract teens and youth of different ethnicities and backgrounds. So I urge you to strengthen the tobacco retailer licensing laws by restricting e-cigarette and vape product sales and the density of tobacco retailers near schools and ban all flavored tobacco products, including hookah in all locations in San Jose. Sincerely, Ira Gupta, 15 PAC member. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Tim Gibbs, welcome. Uh, thank you. Yeah, this is Tim Gibbs. I'm with the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. And um, prohibiting the sale of flavored tobacco products, including menthol cigarettes, and all retailers is a critical step that will help protect children living in San Jose from the unrelenting efforts by the tobacco industry to hook them to a deadly addiction. You know, we were so close to having these protections with the passage of SB 793. The law, which would have prohibited the sale of most flavored tobacco products statewide, was set to go into effect on January 1st. San Jose children would have been prevented from getting access to flavored tobacco products like Captain Crunch flavored e-juice as well as menthol cigarettes. But the tobacco companies spent over $20 million with a reckless referendum to try and put the law on hold for two years, or, to, or at best to put the, law on two year, put the law on hold for two years and at worst to overturn the law. So in the middle of a pandemic, they put Californians at risk with nearly a million face-to-face -face interactions to collect sin signatures so they could continue to put communities of color and children at risk with their flavored products. The tobacco companies have effectively stolen the protections that would have been offered by SB 793 from the children of San Jose for at least the next two years. We urge San Jose to respond by continuing the effort to pass a strong flavored tobacco ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Lori Bremner. Welcome. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Lori Bremner, California. Oh, Lori, we're having a hard time hearing you. Let me try plugging in one second. Is this better? Yes, much better. Okay, sorry about that. Thank My you. name is Lori Bremner with PAVE California. PAVE is Parents Against Vaping E-Cigarettes. We're a national parents organization founded in 2018 as a grassroots response to the youth vaping epidemic. I am a parent, I'm a daughter who lost her dad too young to tobacco related illness, and I'm a cancer survivor. PAVE is in support of a comprehensive tobacco retail licensing ordinance that includes a full ban on the sale of all flavored tobacco products, including menthol cigarettes and hookah, and includes all locations, including adult-only stores. We know that flavors hook kids. The tobacco industry knows that as well, which is why they sell minty, menthol, and other candy-flavored products that are attractive to kids. If any flavors are left on the shelves, the youth will just chase whatever flavor is available, as that is what enticed them to try nicotine in the first place. The youth of San Jose simply cannot wait for the state or the federal government to take action to prevent <laughs> and protect them. As Mr. Carrillo explained, recent state legislation has made it much harder for kids to get these products online, but the tobacco industry has forced a delay of a statewide flavor ban for two years. The FDA regulations leave huge loopholes on which the industry has capitalized, first by leaving menthol cigarettes on the market and more recently by exempting disposable products that are cheap and cool and super popular with the kids. 
San Jose families are counting on you, our local elected officials, to value our kids' health higher than the profits of businesses that exist to sell deadly products. Please strengthen the tobacco retail licensing ordinance, include all retailers, and include all flavored tobacco products. Thank you. Thank you. Rosalind Moya, welcome. Hi, my name is Rosalind Moya. I'm a member of the Santa Clara County Tobacco Free Coalition. And I just wanna um, give a thank you to the committee for tackling this issue and council members Carrasco and Polly for your leadership on this. Um, I'd like to ask that no exemptions be given for menthol or, to or um, tobacco adult stores. The tobacco industry has used menthols to hook youth and also persons of color like African-Americans, Pacific Islanders and Filipinos. The tobacco industry has also used cultural flavors to target kids and persons of color, like boba tea and ube and chicken and waffles. According to the Health and Human Services, menthol is the second most popular flavor among youth at 63.9%, only 2% less than the most popular flavor. But where are the youth getting these products? A local study showed that 45.4% of teens in Santa Clara County reported purchasing their own e-cigarettes with over a quarter of this group saying they buy them directly from a local store. Among those who purchased e-cigarettes in a local store, 62.5 purchased them at a vape shop. Healthy communities are planned with intention. It's not fair that San Jose is saturated with tobacco retailers. That means more tobacco access, more tobacco advertising, more tobacco litter, and more youth tobacco use. Our youth have enough to deal with, with let's protect our youth. This is your chance to make San Jose healthy. With youth tobacco smoke and vape increasing the diagnosis and symptoms of COVID by five to seven times, this ordinance is more important than ever. Thank you for your putting our youth first. Thank you. Carol McRuder, welcome. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, good evening or good afternoon. I'm Carol Magruder and I'm one of the co-chairs of the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council. Uh, we have been fighting since our creation in 2008 and more importantly in 2009 when President Obama signed the Tobacco Control Act to get mentholated tobacco products off of the market. Menthol was given a pass at that time when all other flavored combustible tobacco cigarettes were taken off the market. Uh, we've been waiting quite a while and as recently as this year, we have actually um, began an administrative lawsuit against the FDA and our co-plaintiffs are Action on Smoking or Health, the American Medical Association and the National Medical Association just recently joined us as a co-plaintiff. So we know that tobacco control is a street fight. It's a city fight as we see with the interference of our state law that was just passed in August. We know that if the tobacco industry is against something that we should be for it because they have addicted our children for decades particularly African-Americans and priority populations. So I urge you to enact legislation to take mentholated tobacco products and all flavored tobacco products out of the reach of our children. Uh, black smokers are not born with the Newport in their mouths. They begin smoking as other people do when they're teenagers and young adults. And we have been just left out to dry of the African-American community in terms of the predatory targeting of the tobacco industry against our people. So please stand with us, protect black children and all children, uh, get these deadly products off the market. Um, and we will, we're waiting for the fight when we see what's gonna happen with the st our state bill. But in the interim, we need our cities and our counties to enact strong legislation to stop the cycle of addiction of our citizens and protect our babies and our children. I also wanna encourage you to have strong multi-unit housing protections. Poor people who live in multi-unit housing deserve to breathe clean air, just like people who can afford their own single family residences. So please also enact strong multi-unit housing provisions as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sonia Gutierrez, welcome. Hi, San Jose Council members. My name is Ava Phillips and I am representing the Stanford Tobacco Prevention Toolkit Youth Action Board. I am 16 years old and a junior at Lincoln High School in San Jose Unified School District. I'm here to encourage the council to take action on existing tobacco retailer listing 
licensing, and flavors to protect the youth of San Jose. As a student, every day I see my peers suffer from the use of flavor tobacco products. Some of my closest friends face addiction and cannot go a day without hitting their vape. As a teen who represents the youth in San Jose, I ask you, San Jose Council members, to do everything in your power to protect the youth from these deadly and addictive products. With your power, you can help ban all flavored tobacco products, restrict e-cigarette and vape product sales, as well as restricting the density of tobacco retailers near schools. By taking action, you are creating a safer community for our youth. For our youth. Thank you, Honorable San Jose community members. Thank you. Bonnie Halpern Felsher, welcome. Hi, dear assembly members, and hopefully you can hear me this time. I apologize for the last time. Uh, thank you, Council Member Carrasco and Foley in particular for your leadership in this area. My name is Dr. Bonnie Halpern Felsher, and I'm a tenured professor of pediatrics at Stanford University. And I'm a developmental psychologist and founder and executive director of the Tobacco Prevention Toolkit. I have over 25 years of experience researching why youth use tobacco. I know that you're hearing from many advocates, parents, and youth today, and I wanted to add in my voice based on my own research that I conduct at Stanford. I'm happy and thankful that San Jose is considering these ordinances and I encourage you to move them to the full committee. This is important because as a scientist with over 170 publications, I can honestly say that this ordinance is based on evidence and will go far to protect our kids from, from a lifetime of tobacco addiction by ending the sale of flavored tobacco. I have four main concerns. First, we recently published a paper that clearly showed a relationship between flavored tobacco use, tobacco use in general, and the initiation and onset of COVID-19. Second, there are over 15,000 e-cigarette flavors and numerous flavors in all other tobacco products, including cigarette, cigars and hookah. Flavors including mint and menthol attract young and new users. In fact, most youth cite flavors as a reason for why they use, and they report that they would quit tobacco use if flavors were not available. And our research shows that these flavors are in all the products. Finally, flavors mask the risk, and they're getting these flavors from the local retail shop. Now's the time to act as we fight the virus. It's never been more important to keep our lungs healthy. Coronavirus attacks those lungs, and in growing young people, we have to do everything we can to prevent their use. I thank you very much for all the work that you're doing and for moving this forward. Thank you, Dr. Felsher. Um, I see here Sonia Gutierrez. Oh, um, I just went already, so it's okay. A thank you so much. I appreciate <laughs> that. Hmm. Okay, we're gonna skip that one. Uh, Rochelle Smith. Rochelle Smith. Yes, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Welcome. Hello, hello. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. My name is Rachel Smith, speaking today on behalf of Eight Omega Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated here at San Jose State. Um, I'm here today to support a citywide ordinance ending the sale of all flavored tobacco products. Um, I'm a California native and live in San Jose, where I've been a student at San Jose State as a public health major with a minor in African American Studies. I know that the committee would benefit from hearing from someone who, you know, has direct care in the black uh, in the black community. So today I'll be going over a few facts regarding tobacco. So first, one in eight Santa Clara County teens use tobacco products. This is an extremely shocking fact because there are so many black teens drawn to the dangerous tobacco products disguised as harmless, sweet flavored vape. And um, this can have unknowingly detrimental effects on all teens. Uh, this can get them addicted to smoking in general, which can have a correlation to poor academics in the classroom. 
Um, another fact that I found was nearly a quarter of surveyed San Jose tobacco retailers sold tobacco to an underage person. This is extremely unacceptable. We need to protect our youth community with a hands-on approach. We need to address the vendors and force them to stop selling to our youth because we cannot afford to lose any more people to an abuse of tobacco use. In summary, I believe that these are a few reasons why the council should support the ordinance to end the sale of all flavored tobacco products. I just wanna thank you, Mayor, and the council members for the opportunity to appear before you all today. And I hope that you guys hear us out. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Uh, our next speaker is Lauren Shoemaker. Welcome. Hi, council members. Thank you for your time and consideration. My name is Lauren Shoemaker. I'm a student at Santa Clara University and I am interning with Breathe California as an emerging community leader. I'm speaking because the city of San Jose is jeopardizing the health of its residents. I am under 21 and have witnessed tobacco use at my college However, I've been even more shocked to see the tobacco product use among my high school brother and his friend group. I have seen the popularity of flavored tobacco products firsthand, and I'm shocked to see how widespread access is to them among youths. I grew up in Washington and know of high schools where they had to remove bathroom stall doors to, di to discourage youths from smoking during school. I saw friends on sports teams lose their stanima and develop breathing issues due to vaping. I believe limiting the distance tobacco retailers can be from schools and further licensing restrictions are a step in the right direction. Please, please protect the youth of our community from big tobacco. Thank you again. Thank you. Tracy Brown, welcome. Hello and greetings council members and community members at large. My name is Tracy Brown and I'm a proud alum alumni of San Jose State University College of Education and the project manager for the AATCLC. I am speaking to urge you to act progressively to protect some of your most targeted citizens, members of the African American community by enacting a comprehensive ordinance. The ordinance must end the sale of flavored tobacco products, which includes all menthol nicotine products with no exemptions of any kind. A comprehensive ordinance is not just an attractive option, it's a critical need. The tobacco industry has been targeting the African American community um, including youth and people of all ages, literally for, for centuries, from chattel slavery to, uh, to support tobacco plantations to menthol targeting. The tobacco industry has shown their interest in attracting and addicting black smokers without concern for the harm that tobacco products cause. The scourge of COVID-19 makes this an even more critical issue. Additional concerns have been expressed about the possibility of disenfranchising cultural users of tobacco products like hookah and even menthol, menthol products. These are misleading cultural narratives designed to manipulate by using the threat of negative public perception around cultural insensitivity. These narratives are lies and they serve to disrespect the cultures and the people that they reference. No one but no one who cares anything about the African American community will advocate for the sale of products that have been statistically proven to be effective tools for the systematic killing of black people, certainly not in the interest of revenue. You have the power to stop these profit driven businesses and companies in their tracks in San Jose. So if you believe that black lives and black loans matter, then show it by protecting African Americans of all ages. Uh, by implementing a comprehensive ordinance regulating all tobacco products, including menthol, without exemptions of any type. Thank you for taking a stand against big tobacco and tobacco proper tears while protecting San Jose youth family and black lives. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lizzie Belton. Welcome. Hello, uh, good afternoon council members. This is Lizzie Belton with the American Heart Association. Thank you for your consideration of a comprehensive flavor tobacco sales restriction and update to your tobacco retail license. This summer, Gavin Newsom signed Senate Bill 793 to restrict the sale of flavored tobacco products in our state. And just last month, the tobacco industry filed signatures to send it to the November 2022 ballot. Should it qualify for that ballot, it would delay implementation for two years and we must continue to pass local policies that cover all flavored tobacco products and codify at the local level 
the San Jose's youth cannot wait for two years. We know a policy is only as good as its implementation and its enforcement. The AHA strongly recommends that enforcement is considered at the beginning of the policy adoption for flavored tobacco. You have an opportunity to update your current licensing requirements and meet some of the best practices used throughout the Bay Area. Uh, a tobacco retail license gives flavored tobacco restrictions some teeth, and it matches your intent to protect San Jose youth and residents from tobacco-related diseases. A strong tobacco retail license requires establishing a license fee that is adequate to cover the cost of enforcement. A minimum of at least one compliance check per year with rechecks within three months for violations. An escalating fine and suspension structure leading to revocation and language that the owner and licensee shall be responsible for all violations and fines. The Heart Association would be happy to partner with the city and staff on these recommendations. And please join the county and your fellow cities by adopting a tobacco retail license update with a strong enforcement and full flavors policy. It's time now more than ever to put the health above profit. Thank you. Thank you. I believe Tracy Brown already spoke. Genesis Merriman. Welcome. Hello, uh, my name is Genesis Merriman and I'm a former long-term resident of San Jose's District 8. I've lived in San Jose for over 15 years and my family still currently resides there. Today I'm speaking on behalf of my two younger sisters in support of a stronger tobacco retail license policy to protect them and all of our youth from the harmful effects of tobacco. As has been mentioned already, the data shows that youth are overwhelmingly using e-cigarette devices and flavored tobacco products, the majority of which are purchased by youth at in-person stores. When I was in high school, I clearly remember how often my friends would vape and use tobacco products, always having their usual stores where they knew they wouldn't be carded and where they knew the supply of tobacco products was endless. My sister, who recently graduated from Silver Creek, often tells me about how students still always vape in the bathroom, in the hallways, or outside at lunch. Tobacco products are far too accessible for youth in San Jose, so accessible that it is almost normal now, and especially in areas with more Black and Latino residents. San Jose needs to make the existing tobacco retailer licensing policy a strong ordinance by including key provisions to protect the youth of our community who are especially vulnerable to this deadly addiction. I was lucky enough to avoid tobacco use while I was growing up in San Jose, but that doesn't mean that there weren't plenty of opportunities for me to use it. I worry about the next generation of youth who are growing up with an influx of flavored products and vaping devices designed for their attention like never before. For all of these reasons, I urge you to move this policy forward to the full council. Um, thank you for your consideration and thank you again to council members Carrasco and Fowley for your leadership on this issue. Thank you. Carol Baker, welcome. Thank you. My name is Carol Baker. I'm a volunteer with the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network and co-chair of the Tobacco Free Coalition of Santa Clara County. You know, stores and vape shops that sell flavored tobacco products have childish flavors like cotton candy, slushies, swisher sweets, fruity, F-R-O-O-T-Y, and of course, menthol that makes it easier to get hooked in the first place. Um, I beg you to pass these strong ordinances with no exemptions, no exceptions. And I wanna thank you for all that you've done to protect the youth of San Jose and encourage you to continue the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and the next speaker is Krupa S. Welcome. Hello, council members. Um, I'm Krupa, but I'm actually here today to sound the voice of Aditya Indla, who is not able to join today due to his schoolwork. Uh, and I'm reading his testimony here. Um, my name is Aditya Indla, and I'm representing the Stanford Tob Tobacco Prevention Toolkit Youth Action Board and the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. Right now, one in eight Santa Clara County teens use tobacco products, exposing them to nicotine at a time when their brains are still developing. And one of the primary methods they get these products is through tobacco retailers located right next to their schools. Nearly a quarter of tobacco retailers in San Jose have sold tobacco to youth, and nearly all of those products were flavored, either with menthol or fruit. The best and only solution available today is a comprehensive tobacco retail licensing. Nearly seven of 10 Santa Clara County residents support policies restricting flavored tobacco and preventing stores near schools from selling tobacco. And 60% support restricting the sale of all vaping products. By implementing a comprehensive retail licensing, licensing policy, the city council can make 
the voices of these residents heard and make San Jose safer for you. Thank you for giving him and me this opportunity. <coughs> Thank you. Trisha Barr. Trisha Barr, welcome. Hi, thank you, and especially thank you to council members Crasco and Foley for bringing this forward. I'm Trisha Barr and a parent of three middle and high school age kids. I'm also a PTA member advocate and on the high school's site council. Um, I'm also a member of the Santa Clara County Tobacco Education Coalition. And I wanted to, to share that um, because, because of the increase of the use of tobacco products and and the problems that this has posed in our schools, that this summer, the California State PTA adopted a resolution urging legislation, quote unquote, prohibiting the sale, marketing, and distribution of flavored tobacco products and e-cigarettes, including components, accessories, and tobacco product flavor enhancers. San Jose should not, and that end of the quote, um, San Jose shouldn't fall behind here. Please join the other 80 plus cities and counties in California by developing a strong ordinance that mirrors the county ordinance by prohibiting the sale of all e-cigarettes and flavored tobacco without any exemptions and prohibiting the sale of all tobacco products and pharmacies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and in our last, we lost our last uh, speaker. That was our last speaker. And I'm going to return to my council colleague. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, council member Foley. Thank you, member council. <laughs> Thank you, council member Carrasco. I it's been it. a long day. It's okay. <laughs> it's been a long day. And, and, and uh, I, I will uh, defer to you in a few moments as you were the one who first brought this forward, particularly as it relates to the flavored cigarettes and uh, vape devices. And then we moved it forward in priority setting session where both of our items were uh, heading, he we're merged together and now we're going forward, which I'm really, really excited about. I want to thank the members of the public who came here to passionately encourage us to move quickly. I'm, uh, I hear your words and I would not have co-authored or authored the priority setting item that I had if I didn't feel the same passion for you as it relates to moving the rest or restricting where e-cigarettes are sold. Um, I am disappointed. I was proud of the legislature for the, the uh, adoption of SB 793 earlier this year. Very disappointed, but not surprising in the tobacco industry for fighting it. Uh, that's not uh, unusual and was not to be, uh, uh, was to be expected. So I believe we need to move as quickly as possible. My question is, uh, and of course I will move this forward and make the motion in, in just a couple of minutes, but my question is how quickly can we move this to council? What's the next step for us to move this to council so we can adopt it and get the ordinance on the books? Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, we have a, put forth a pretty aggressive timeline in our work plan and we wanna actually get it to council in March is what we want to do. That makes me really happy <laughs> uh, because we cannot wait. We cannot wait for the, ch the health of our children while they are home uh, with COVID and sheltering in place. It, they are not as um, out and about, although they really are, we know they're out and about but they're not uh, at school and have more free time to go from school to get home and end up at the a vendor who, a, toba a tobacco shop that they can get their e-cigarettes from uh, as easily, but they are out there and they're getting them. And I am very concerned about how addictive tobacco is, how it affects their brain functions, how this, how what happens to them as teenagers will affect their lives down the line and they're not thinking that. All they're thinking is these are cool. 
it's a cool device. It's a cool, I look cool smoking. Kind of reminds me of those TV shows in the 50s and 60s where the guys had the pack of cigarettes rolled up in their shoulders and you thought, oh, that is really cool. But it's not cool. It stinks. It's disgusting. It's a filthy habit and it's addictive and it's secondhand smoke is just as bad. So we must do everything in, in our power to res restrict these e-cigarettes e and flavored cigarettes from our youth. Adults, you know, they're adults are adults and they have control in a different way, but we have to protect our children. And I know that children are not gonna listen to their parents. They're gonna listen to their fellow teenagers as to what's cool. So even though we say we have to put the onus on the parents, that's not fair because the parents are doing the best that they can but kids are kids and they're not going to listen to them. As a mom of a 24 year old who's not smoking and thank God she's not. When I hear of people who are around her, it, it disturbs me because it just, it's just, it's frustrating. So we need to do everything in, we can, in our power. Oscar, I'm glad to hear we're going to see this before council in March. And with that, I will uh, accept the status report. And do we need to move it forward or, or we're good? Just accepting the report is good enough? That's correct. Yes, council member, I believe that's correct. Okay, then I move to accept the report. Second. Second. And thank you, Carrasco, uh, Matt, <laughs> Carrasco. Magdalena, <laughs> whatever. Thank you, thank you, Madam Vice Chair, current chair. I appreciate your leadership in this area and thank you so much. I was gonna say, I, I think we've all been graduated to uh, assembly members and mayors of the city according to our speaker. So, <laughs> so I'll take it. Uh, thank you, thank you for your leadership, council member Foley and, uh, and for my council colleagues support on this. It's an important issue. Uh, but before I make my comments, council member Esparza, you've got the mic. I'll keep it brief. I just wanted to thank you both for your leadership on this, this issue. I wanted to thank all the speakers that came to speak, um, including a lot of very passionate young people, which is always wonderful to hear. Um, and, uh, and come back in March. Thank you. I think you're muted, Madam Chair. There, thank you. I don't see any other hands. Uh, Council Member Jimenez, uh, jump right in if you if you'd like to speak. Uh, but I want to thank all of our speakers for coming out and waiting around and uh, and really taking your time to speak on such an important issue. Uh, I agree with with all of the speakers uh, who spoke today. There's such a, a great sense of urgency, especially as it pertains to our communities of concern, uh, our African American. Uh, uh, com uh, population, you know, they've been preyed upon by by big tobacco companies and uh, uh, and and our teenagers, our young folks. Uh, what really prompted me at the time when I wrote the the memos, uh, interestingly enough, was uh, conversations uh, that I was having very casually with my own teenagers who were talking to me about these binge vaping sessions that their friends were having. And I was completely oblivious to it. Uh, uh, and who would have thought that, you know, I'm like so hip and cool about things. I thought I knew everything. And, uh, and vaping is such a new phenomena. And it's uh, an interesting phenomena that's uh, taking place among our, our youth. And it's such a dangerous practice. And it's very, very addictive. Interestingly enough, and some of the, the speakers spoke on this, they, they're not having other folks buy it for them. They're walking right in to the establishments and they're purchasing these products directly from the businesses. And that's what's uh, equally as shocking as, uh, as what they're engaging in. And, uh, and so we, we can't have that continue, at least not in this city. And so I'm glad that, that the state is, is doing what they need to do. I hope that they, uh, they, they do see the sense of urgency that needs to happen because every time that they do it, 
uh, you know, it, it carries a greater uh, intensity of nicotine. And so with that comes a greater opportunities for addiction. Now we know that COVID has changed everything in terms of the way that we see, our, we see policy, how we see health inequities and how we see our own uh, uh, health and how we take care of ourselves. But when we look at respiratory conditions, we know that COVID uh, attacks us even more so and makes sure that it, it uh, attaches itself. So this definitely makes us more vulnerable, even for the, the, the apparently healthy person. So, uh, so I'm glad that we're moving on this aggressively, as you say, and that we'll see this in March. And, uh, and that especially when it comes to flavored tobacco, um, you know, uh, those of us uh, who, who gravitate towards things that are yummy, <laughs> who doesn't, um, you know, uh, we won't see that in our city any longer. At least it'll be one thing that we can check off our list. So thank you so much, Council Member Foley, for, for seeing this as an issue that needed to be addressed as well in order to protect our children. We can't protect them from everything. And at some point, you know, free will is uh, is is powerful, and we can only do uh, so much in terms of guiding our children. But we can put some some measures in place and hope that our kiddos will will be able to make the right decisions. And um, may may uh, may God be with with them at that point. So uh, thank you so much. There is a motion on the floor. And with that, Madam. Yes. Clerk. Yes. Louis. Aye. Ms. Barza. Yes. Crosco. Aye. Thank you. Thank you so much. And as I am opening up my, my agenda on my other uh, trusty apparatus here. Give me a moment because I think we're going on to our last item, right? Yes. That's correct. Yes. Our last item with, uh, yeah. And Thank you. Help me, guide me. Yeah, we got one last item and, and uh, I believe it's, uh, it's our same team on PVCE regarding um, housing. And so I'll turn it over to Rosalind and her team. There you go. Thank you, Angel Fields. <laughs> Thank you so much, Angel. So yes, our last item um, for discussion is actually related to the previous item. This is another city council uh, policy priority um, item on smoke-free housing. Um, and I do want to take a note and just thank um, Santa Clara County and their partnership, the public health department, um, and because without the funding that we received through their cities, Healthy Cities program, uh, we really wouldn't be able to come as far as we have um, on, on both work items. So just want to acknowledge that. And uh, with that, we do have a brief presentation. I'm going to turn it over uh, to Rita Tobaldo, who is also um, an acting division manager in our code enforcement division. And Rita, I can share my screen if you like. Um, that's fine. Go ahead. Okay. If not, I can do it. I'm fine. I think I have it right now. There we go. Okay. Good afternoon, vice chair, council members and committee staff. As Rosalind mentioned, I'm Rita Tobaldo, Interim Division Manager for Code Enforcement. I would also like to introduce the county staff and uh, Leslie Sellers, Policy Consultant, Don Tran, County Health Specialist. We also have Joy, um, Joyce Villalobos and as well as Jennifer Aguilar. They will be available to assist with any related questions, county related questions after the presentation. So as today, we are providing a status report on city council policy priority um, 18, smoke-free housing. And just to give you a little bit of a background, how did it get started? This initiated back in 2017, a former council member Rocha brought forth a memo, bringing this item to the Rules and Open Government Committee so that it can be brought forth to the city council policy priority setting sessions. And the history was back in 2017, the item ranked item 22. 
March 2019, it ranked item 23. And as recent this year, the um, item was ranked um, 18. As we mentioned, we are in partnership with the Santa Clara County Public Health Department, Healthy Cities Program grant funding. So we submitted an application back in 2018. In November of 5th, 2018, notification of the award was received. We received approximately $65,000 with an in-kind county policy consultant support for the work. The contract was executed. The contract term began February 2nd, 2020, and it terms to June 30th, 2021. Currently, Chapter 9.44 Regulation of Smoking with the San Jose Municipal Code prohibits smoking in publicly accessible and common areas, enclosed or unenclosed. However, it does not prohibit smoking inside units. So now we're going to move over to the work plan items that we have completed. In, um, initially, we did a joint community survey. And the survey was open in August 6 through October 31st. And we had a total of 1,442 respondents. If you can go to the next slide, please. And based on this information, um, the respondents, there were 76% that currently live in multiple family housing. The survey was provided in multiple languages. It was English, Spanish, Vietnamese, and Chinese. We did a uh, online media outlets such as um, a PBC Facebook page, um, Nextdoor app. The survey was introduced at uh, two Project Hope community meetings. We additionally did a mailer to approximately 67 property owners through the residential occupancy permit process. We've also done research and benchmarking. So we are aware five local jurisdictions have adopted 100% smoke-free housing laws. Los Gatos, Montes Reno, Palo Alto, Santa Clara, Sunnyvale, and Santa Clara County. And based on the report from the Santa Clara County, 33% households live in multifamily units. Um, in the city of San Jose, we have approximately 101,000 apartment units in San Jose, but this does not include condos. So um, work plan items in progress. So where are we? We completed, um, we're in the process to complete a joint county city racial health equity assessment. We're also going to be coordinating with the Office of Racial Equity, as well as the housing department. And we will be doing that the first quarter of the calendar year 2021. What are the keys of enforcement and key elements that we're looking into? We are looking into a face-in approach, looking into lease requirements, education and resources for the community. We wanna ensure that there's uh, resources available for folks that want to quit smoking, cessation centers, and also a um, education campaign. The enforcement to be self and complete driven enforcement the next two slides that are coming forth will highlight information directly coming from the survey. And this basically shows um, the uh, respondents that were identified by race. We can see here that we have 50% of the respondents uh, white, 17% Hispanic, 20% Asian, and then 3% um, black, and then 9% that did not disclose other. Also, we on the column to the right, we have survey respondents by income level. Here we can see the, the largest respondents based um, on the income 100,000 or greater were 41%. 75 to 99,000 were in the 14% bracket that responded and then uh, 50 to 74K, we're in the rounding it off to 11%. And then the other group, 34K or less, we're in the rounding it off again to 12%. And then 17% prefer not to answer. So um, again, based on the results for the survey here, we're seeing that 
69 of the respondents, 69% um, declared they had been exposed to secondhand smoke. And then um, the other one, 69% also stated smoking should be prohibited in multifamily units. And then 71% said smoking should be prohibited in multifamily units, balconies, and patios. So um, going to the next steps. So we basically have completed some of those items. What do we plan to do? So what is next? So what we need to do is to continue further stakeholder and community outreach, continue the racial equity analysis to determine who will benefit, who will be highly impacted, and then the implementation piece and enforcement plan to ensure that once we implement an ordinance that we have a solid plan of enforcement development of policy recommendations by June 2021. And we are planning to return to the committee spring 2021 with smoke-free housing policy recommendations. So this basically concludes our, our status report presentation. We are open for questions and feedback. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm gonna start moving through this very quickly because I'm, I'm afraid I'm gonna lose a quorum here. Uh, I'm going to turn to the speakers, Brian Davis. Good afternoon, council members. Can you hear me? Yes. My name is. No. Sorry, that was that was my mistake. I accidentally um, clicked disable talking while he was speaking. So Brian, can you please start over? Okay. Um, good afternoon, council members. My name is Brian Davis, and I'm a member of the Tobacco-Free Coalition of Santa Clara County. I have an incurable lung disease that is aggravated by secondhand smoke. My husband and I have lived in a seven-unit building for 28 years. About 10 years ago, we had a chain-smoking neighbor below us who refused to smoke outside, and our unit was flooded with his toxic smoke. When he moved out, our landlord agreed to require new tenants to not smoke in their apartments. More recently, a cannabis smoking and vaping tenant occupied the unit sharing our bedroom wall. Breathing was difficult at times. Despite numerous talks with her and our landlord, she continued to smoke in the unit because there is no law to protect vulnerable tenants like me. Fortunately, she moved out a few months ago but many other people continue to suffer from secondhand smoke exposure due to their inconsiderate neighbors. My question is, will San Jose choose to protect the health of tenants or reward the selfishness of their neighbors? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Margo, uh, Margo Seidner. Hello, council members, committee members, and staff. It's Margo Seidner again to express Breathe California's enthusiastic support for strengthening regulations to control smoking in all multi-unit housing. Breathe California has run a secondhand smoke helpline for almost 30 years. And we had an MOU with the city to help identify non-compliant parties when the city passed its 2012 secondhand smoke ordinance. For many years, the, the key chief complaint of the vast majority of our callers has been their neighbors smoking. For those with lung disease, such as children with asthma or seniors with COPD, neighbors smoking causes serious health issues and can be life-threatening. Some callers have even had to flee their homes and shelter elsewhere. Um, drifting smoke from their neighbors is a special problem for low-income households. We find that they often fear eviction if they cause trouble by bringing it to the attention of the landlords. We offer anonymous educational interventions with their landlords, but sometimes they are still afraid of even having us bring up the topic with the landlords because some of them have been threatened with eviction if they complain to anyone. As you can imagine, there has been a significant increase in the complaints due to COVID with neighbors all sheltering at home. We believe the best solution is a ban on smoking inside and outside units. And 
several cities and counties have enacted such bans with success, which you heard about in the um, in the presentation. Of note, we ought, we also have been contacted by landlords who want to go 100% smoke free and would appreciate the city's backing. So please forward this to the full council for action because all San Jose residents deserve to breathe smoke free air. Thank you. Thank you, Amaya Wooding. Good afternoon, council members. My name is still Amaya Wooding. I still use she, her pronouns, and I still co-chair Proudly Against Tobacco, the Bay Area's LGBTQ plus tobacco control coalition. So tobacco use is the leading cause of preventable death in this country, and LGBTQ plus people in California smoke twice as much as a general population. So when someone decides to quit, it should be celebrated and supported. But in the absence of a smoke-free multi-unit housing policy, someone's efforts could be thwarted by a neighbor they don't even know. Secondhand smoke can deliver enough nicotine to the brain to trigger cravings, and even some levels of thirdhand smoke, which settles on surfaces and can stay there for months after a smoker moves out, increase the likelihood of relapse. Also, to tie this to our region's ongoing housing and homelessness crisis, work out of UC San Francisco links increased nicotine dependence to greater difficulty exiting homelessness and entering permanent housing. Meanwhile, smoke-free multi-unit housing policies increase cessation and decrease the amount of cigarettes smoked by residents who continue to smoke. Uh, all in all, this is a great policy for community health, and I thank you for considering it. Thank you. And my apologies, in order for me not to lose quorum, I'm going to uh, read, I'm going to have speakers speak for one minute. Audrey Abadia, one minute. Hi there. Okay. Um, good evening, council members, committee, and staff. My name is Audrey Badilla. I'm the manager of advocacy and community impact at Breathe California, and I'm speaking in support of uh, ending smoking in multi-unit housing. Um, I live in an apartment complex, and half of the residents smoke and Regularly, I feel my own chest tighten and my breathing labored. Um, community is everywhere are tightening up their stay at home orders and our city leaders are asking residents to be heroes by staying home and saving others. All the while, the lack of protection makes people at home victims for doing just that. Um, we have protective masks on the moment we step outside and there should be no reason we feel the need to use it inside our homes too. I urge you to push forward um, to the full council, uh, a strong measure to ensure we can all breathe freely where we live. Thank you so much. Thank you. Vanessa Marvin. Hi, good afternoon, council members. My name is Vanessa Marvin. I'm a San Jose resident in District 6, and I also live in multi-unit housing in a condo complex near Deerdon Station. And I'm also the co-chair of the Tobacco-Free Coalition of Santa Clara County, which consists of organizations who are promoting our health, including healthcare agencies, hospitals, local nonprofits, and community agencies and residents. We are urging you to move forward with a strong ordinance to protect San Jose residents from drifting secondhand smoke in multi-unit housing and to think about protecting all residents, whether in apartments or condos, duplexes or townhomes, the risk and the danger is the same. And to protect us from all drifting smoke, tobacco smoke, marijuana smoke, vape, vapor, all of it is dangerous to our health. And while there are many laws that have been passed both in California and San Jose that protect residents from secondhand smoke, those of us who are residents of multi-unit housing are not protected from secondhand smoke in our own homes. In fact, the home is now the number one source of secondhand smoke exposure because it's where people spend the most time. So we urge you to move forward and pass a strong policy here in San Jose. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lizzie Velten. Good afternoon, Supervisors. Lizzie Velten, again with American Heart Association. Uh, we support protecting San Jose residents of multi-unit housing from secondhand smoke. Secondhand smoke can cause serious disease and premature death among non-smokers. Research has documented the transfer of secondhand smoke in the air and of secondhand smoke constituents through heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems, and other connections between units. And there is no safe level of exposure to secondhand smoke. It has an immediate negative effect on heart function, blood platelets, inflammation, endothelial function, and vascular system. And long-term exposure to secondhand smoke is associated with a 25 to 30% increased risk of coronary heart disease in adult non-smokers. Smoke-free multi-unit housing ordinances are an important strategy to protect vulnerable populations from dangerous secondhand smoke exposure in their own homes. We suggest this policy include language requiring public education, adequate signage and awareness raising to ensure compliance, culturally and linguistically appropriate cessation services, 
and avoidance of this issue, statute being used to evict residents that are also victims of addiction by a deadly industry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shika Handa. Hi, um, my name is Shika. I'm a legislative ambassador of the American Cancer Society and a biology student. Um, I would like, I would just like to say that as someone who studies biology, I think it's really important to understand and emphasize the harmfulness of secondhand smoke. Secondhand smoking increases the risk of cancer, particularly lung and breast cancer. There was a report from the California Environmental Protection Agency Air Resources Board that mentions that exposure to secondhand smoke can increase a woman's risk of breast cancer by 90%. There's also a bunch of growing scientific evidence that shows that secondhand smoke exposure is a cause of breast cancer, primarily in women under the age of 50 who have never smoked. Um, looking at this bio biologically, tobacco smoke contains fat soluble compounds that induce tumors and of the 50 known cancer causing agents in cigarettes 20 specifically target breast tissue and memory glands um, my mom who's 46 and did not smoke passed away in january from breast cancer and we lived in an apartment building in san jose for 10 years that was not smoke free which could have contributed to her death I know firsthand everything that passed from their space to mine from water leakage to sounds of piano practice and more and i can't bear the mind that uh, can't bear the idea that my mom could have permitted to share secondhand smoke with them. So I think it's really important to protect all people from secondhand smoke, and we can do this by creating more safe spaces for non-smokers. So I urge the council to move forward with a policy that protects all San Jose multi-unit housing Thank residents from secondhand smoke. Thank you, Shika. Diana Canales. Good afternoon, council members and committee staff. My name is Diana Canales. I live in San Jose's District 3 and also work as a health educator at Breathe California. I also reside in a multi-unit housing complex and cannot emphasize enough that we need to push for a smoke-free housing policy. Across Santa Clara County, nearly 30% of residents reported smelling smoke drifting into their home in the past week, and 40% of Latinos reported such exposure. In addition to this, we must consider folks who are suffering from COVID-19 symptoms. As someone whose papa has fathered from, um, suffered from COVID-19, recovery is a vital time. We must ensure that those who are still suffering from COVID-19 are able to breathe easily and not worry about extra irritants that can affect their lungs. Council members and committee staff, I urge you all to move forward with a comprehensive policy that protects all San Jose multi-unit housing residents. Thank you for your time and for setting up for our health during one of our most vulnerable moments. Thank you. Genesis Merriman. Uh, hello again. Uh, my name is Genesis Merriman, and I am still a former resident of San Jose District 8, where my family still currently resides. Um, today, I'm speaking on behalf of my family in support of a comprehensive smoke-free multi-unit housing policy that would protect all San Jose multi-unit housing residents, including those who live in duplexes, apartments, townhomes, and condos. As someone who grew up in a condo on the east side, I urge you to move forward with a comprehensive policy so that all multi-unit housing residents, including my parents, are protected. The proposed policy is an important first step towards promoting health equity and improving overall public health in San Jose. Because the movement of smoke between units cannot be controlled and because no level of exposure to tobacco smoke is safe, the only way to effectively protect residents from the harmful effects of secondhand smoke is to completely eliminate smoking in all indoor areas and all multi-unit housing complexes. San Jose is a great city that I'm proud to call my hometown. I hope the committee and council will move this policy forward to make San Jose an even better, safer, and healthier place to live. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. Hi, hello, um, council members and staff. I currently reside in San Jose and, and I am a senior health and wellness intern at Breathe California. I want the council to move forward with a comprehensive policy that protects all San Jose unit multi housing residents from smoke. Um, I myself have lived in multi unit housing for 23 years, all of my life, and I also rely on public transportation. So um, prior to COVID-19, I was constantly exposed to secondhand smoke in the street. During COVID-19, my secondhand smoke exposure has increased, has increased in my own home. Smoking is the number one preventable cause of death in the United States, and it is paramount to protect San Jose residents from exposure to secondhand smoke. 
Exposure to secondhand smoke can result in severe asthma attacks, respiratory infections, sinus infections, and other cardiovascular and pulmonary diseases. Please help lead San Jose to a healthier place by addressing the tragic harm done by secondhand smoking and thirdhand smoking. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And my last speaker is Rosalind Moya. Hi again, um, my name is Rosalind Moya. I'm a member of the Santa Clara County Tobacco Free Coalition. Smoke-free spaces from tobacco and marijuana and multi-unit housing is necessary to protect children, adolescents, seniors, and people with existing health conditions. Low income, and, low income and children of color are more likely to have asthma and are more likely to live in multi-unit housing. I myself have been living in multi-unit housing for the past 20 years and have been exposed to secondhand smoke. Smoke in multi-unit housing widens health inequities and it disproportionately impacts vulnerable communities. It's hard to tell on the phone, but I'm five months pregnant. While I'm very happy and excited to have a baby, big belly, baby kicks and all, it worries me that people who are pregnant are exposed to secondhand smoke to a greater risk of giving birth to low birth weight babies. There's already so much to worry about in this world, especially in these current times, like protecting our lungs from COVID and fires. Breathing toxic and deadly smoke inside the home doesn't have to be one of them. I'd like to thank all of you and the committee for your leadership and time. Thank you so much, Rosalind, and congratulations. And turning back to my council colleagues, uh, council member Esparza. I wanted to again, thank all the speakers that spoke and offer my condolences um, and uh, an appreciation for sharing their uh, experiences in a way that can really make a difference and improve the lives of others in our community. So thank you for your courage um, and sharing your voice. Um, I think that this is a, a hugely important issue. I hear quite often in my office about it as well. And so uh, with that, I'm happy to make a motion and accept the report if that's what we need to do. Um, I know that this comes back to NSE in spring um, with the policy recommendations developed by June. So with that, that's my motion. Second. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm looking to see if I have anybody else. I have no other uh, colleagues. I know that my uh, I'm about to lose quorum real soon. I want to thank uh, the committee. I want to thank uh, everyone who's called in. This is truly a, a, an important and critical issue, especially during this time. But it's an important issue regardless of COVID. We want to make sure that our residents are protected and uh, the health of our communities is safeguarded. Uh, so thank you, council colleagues, uh, for making sure that this uh, happens. Uh, and with that, roll call. Inez? Yes. Oli? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Prosco? Aye. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we can, we can uh, even if we don't have quorum, we're going on to open forum. So thank you, council colleagues. Uh, I see no one. Oh, wait, hold on a second. Mr. Beekman. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you for the meeting today. Uh, NSC meetings can always bring a good deal of care to issues for the community. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can be patient and with a few ideas that I have that I need to practice saying and, and I apologize where I may be wrong and hopefully I can learn. Um, about, uh, there was a Vision Zero uh, committee meeting today. Uh, task force meeting, it brought in interesting ideas of um, there is over, uh, there's about, it seems like uh, 1200 uh, citations issued in the past two months. So that's about 200 issues, 200 citations a day, I think, or something like that. I've been terrible with math, but there's a lot of citations going on in, in a two month period. And with so much 4G and 5G being placed, it's doing new surveillance stuff. There is issues of, uh, you know, Vision Zero law enforcement is working. They are doing their job. And uh, I thought I should say that right now. The KSI issue uh, with, with Vision Zero, uh, that, that we're talking about issues of equity. And so those numbers are gonna be 
a little larger than they used to be in previous years. It's gonna take a couple more months or years to adjust to that. And I hope we can learn to vary the difference from previous years of a high number of KSIs compared to high numbers now. And uh, that needs a little work. On the issues of uh, the uh, city council meeting last week on the future of energy and the use of the uh, hydrogen fuel cells, you know, the mayor really is promoting for the next three years up until 2023 that we practice the ideas of hydrogen fuel cells. And I, I, it seems like an interesting idea that has variation to it. Can he possibly, you know, to prepare ourselves, can he possibly also prepare the ideas of the use of solar power and how to just introduce solar power as a way to prepare for our future and for any disasters that will happen in because of because of because of say earthquakes and and things like that in the next 10 years is there a way that that we can talk about solar power that also can be used in the time after an earthquake we can rely on that energy time and uh, how do we it may not be everything but it's a good supplement that will be needed at that time and i hope the mayor will want to work and think about those ideas sorry for my brashness to say and how i say it uh, hopefully it's, it's an understandable idea. And to conclude, I'm very, very sorry about, um, you know, I've been reporting all fall about the ideas of, of, of COVID and the, the numbers are rising and they keep rising. And I was offering to, you need, we need safe practices. I started offering statistics of death and that it will thank be mellow numbers. Thank you. Number thank you. I thank you so much, Mr. Beekman. It's always so nice to hear from you. And thank you to my council colleagues and staff for, uh, for helping me get through today. Of course, this was an unexpected uh, turn of events and we hope that council member Arenas does really well and recovers from that dreaded little virus that is uh, uh, just switching everything up on us. And of course, uh, we wish her family well. Thank you so much and we will see you next Tuesday. Have a nice and safe weekend.